Welcome to the MBA on Microsoft Blockchain as a Service. My name is Kale Teeter. Uh, I'm here with my colleague Derek Martin, and I'm going to talk a little bit about myself here. I'm a software development engineer at Microsoft. I've been about 15 years development uh, in software development industry, and I've been working mostly with startups and partners now in the blockchain space. And so I spend most, almost all my time working on that right now, and I want to share some of that knowledge about what Microsoft's building in blockchain as a service and how these kind of work together with what uh, my passions are. Yep, and I'm Derek Martin. I am a cloud solution architect in the Azure space, and it's a pleasure to be here with Kale today. Uh, I've been working with blockchain for about a year and uh, really enjoyed uh, learning from my colleagues, learning uh, out in the industry. Uh, my primary focus is around the infrastructure uh, and how you can get DevOps working within Azure uh, and the blockchain ecosystem as a whole. Uh, really looking forward to the session today and uh, hope you enjoy it. So let's get started. Thanks. So, okay, so for, from an agenda perspective, we have five modules that we're going to go through here. The first module, we're going to talk about some of the core technologies behind blockchain, and that includes distributed ledgers as well as consensus mechanisms um, that allow these blockchains to actually function in the real world. So let's get started with that. So in order to start thinking about blockchains and thinking about how these things actually function, you actually really have to get down to the core and understand what, it, what it makes blockchains up. What are the core components that make these yep. things up? And one of the things is these, these digests or digital signatures. It's one of the core components. And if you look at this slide, we basically are showing on this slide that we have a couple different use cases here. We have a, a user here um, that has a username, a birthday, and a SSN, or social security number. And they have a private key. And then we also have a, a device, let's say in this case it's a phone, uh, that has a serial number and a manufacturer good. And those, that thing also has a key that it's going to be able to use to sign things with. Um, so when I say we do a signing operation, we're actually going to use that key and run a hashing algorithm, which is a one-way hash that allows us to basically then unique, generate a unique digest. And you can think of that unique digest as a public key. So those of you that are familiar with PKI and the different... Uh, you like know, PGP and different technologies like that. Exactly. These have been around for 30 plus years. And so when you're thinking about those kind of technologies, it's the exact same technology that we're using here. The primary goal is to be able to generate something publicly that we can share with people, and the only person who could have generated that is the guy who owns the private key. And we have a, another one of our modules here in just a little bit that'll go a little bit deeper into how key management works. But the, one of the really important things to note about this is it's not just people that make up these digests, it's also devices. And so when you start talking about Internet of Things, you start talking about you know, the washing machines and, and different things of the world able to communicate on the, to the blockchain, uh, these devices or people, um, they hold their private key uh, in escrow, and then the public key is what's out there on the, on the blockchain for people to verify against. Correct. Correct. Okay. So basically, in this, in this model, you can see that when we bring those three, we generate unique hashes. Now, keep that in mind as we go to something a little bit more uh, advanced. If we start thinking about, well, we could do that for one device or one human or one object in the world, uh, one other thing that we could do, though, is start to combine these. So let's say that um, in this case we're talking about a phone and we have a touch screen and maybe some memory that goes into that. There's many components inside a phone, right? And we're getting those from different manufacturers or different sources out there. And so each one of those things is unique, right? So when we get that memory chip, there's actually a serial number on it and a good from that manufacturer. Um, touch screen is the same way. But then when we start to combine those together, we actually create another unique device, right? Because we're going to ultimately create a phone here and that phone will have a serial number and some sort of GUID that's going to map to a unique object in the world. Um, so if you think about this, we can generate those hashes just like I showed on that first slide, and then we could take those digests and run those through a hashing algorithm, and then we get another unique hash. And so now what we've done is basically created a unique digest here, or a public key, that if any of those components change for some reason, like if somebody went back and tried to actually change one of the public keys for let's say, the touchscreen or the memory or any of these different components that are in there, it will break, right? Because it, the calculation won't work out for the second one. So it's not just the person and it's not just the object. In these composite objects, we're talking about the person and their object. So it's Kale and his Microsoft phone equal a composite object that can interact with the blockchain as an independent unit of work. Sure. And you can even think about it as a device, just components inside of a device. 
all those little pieces that make it up. If you think about a car, for instance, it's made up of millions of pieces. When they put that thing together, um, we can actually generate hash, and we can ultimately get to one hash or, or one public key or digest over the whole car and basically could describe, and you could go back and look at all the hashes that make up every bolt and nut and computer and everything that's in that car. Um, so it's a unique way to kind of start to combine those, and it kind of folds into what is an actual blockchain. Because what we're thinking about with a blockchain is we have a bunch of transactions that we're going to sign, and they're a composite, right? Because right. there's a bunch of those things, and we're going to smash those together and create a, create a unique hash. So once we have our objects, whether it be an individual or a thing, and then the composite object, then how do we get from that point to a block? Right. So when you think about blockchains now, so let's, we talked a little bit abstract there about devices and humans and these things that we could sign with these keys. When we start talking about now really getting into what's a distributed ledger and what's a blockchain, um, the idea here really is that we have transactions that are going to interact with a blockchain. So think of it as a similar to like a database, right? So we're going to make some transactions into that. We're going to do some write operations that's going to come into this thing. When we do those, they don't happen real time. Uh, if you look at this slide, you can see there's three humans here on this slide who are interacting with a blockchain and they're sending transactions in. And they're all different hashes on those transactions. So again, every time you go to put something on the blockchain, a write operation, we're going to use your key and we're going to sign it. Now we know for sure that came from Derek or it came from Kale. We know 100% because he's the only one who has the private key that could have signed that thing. So in the general sense from where people are uh, most familiar, and we'll talk about different types of chains here in a second, but if I was going to uh, buy a Bitcoin or buy an Ether token, uh, I would sign my transaction. That's why it requires you to put in your password each time. That unlocks your private key. That signs the transaction and then sticks it out here onto this chain of blocks, and then those blocks build up over time. Is that Sure, and we'll talk a little bit in a couple slides about how that operation actually functions, but from a high level, yeah, that's exactly right, Derek. We basically are going to collect all these transactions together, and at some point, we need to create a block. Now, there's different ways to do that. If you look at different blockchains like Bitcoin or Ethereum or even some of the proprietary ones, um, that's kind of like where the secret sauce is, right? How do we figure out how big to make that block and the different parameters that we can kind of feed in to make this blockchain work? So tell me a little bit about headers, and so we're looking at this slide here mm -hmm. around chain of blocks. Uh, what makes up a block? We've got a header, we've got some transactions, which is some keys moving around. What, mm -hmm. what goes into play here? Yeah, so the thing to think about here, again, is think about it like this. We took all those transactions that we built up. In this case, on the slide, you can see we have three transactions. So we hash those, and now we're going to write a block with those. So when we go to write that block, we obviously have a header now. If it's the genesis block or the first block on the blockchain, um, we already have that header in there. Um, and basically what we're going to do now is pack our transactions into there. So we're going to have a list of all these transactions we have in there. We're going to have our hash. And that's going to form what's called a Merkle tree. Mm -hmm. So the Merkle tree is basically saying, okay, now we've got this one block up here. Now when the second block is created, as you can see on this slide, he's going to take the header from the first block and he's going to take the transactions. That's what he's going to use to build his hash. Now you can understand that we have a hard link between these. Nobody can change that history now. If somebody tried to tamper with block one, it'll break the chain because it won't work now. Block two will say, no, that doesn't match with what I have. And so you can think about something as, as big and complex as Bitcoin now has been out since 2011. And all of those blocks since the very first, the Genesis block, are mathematically linked in this Merkle tree mm -hmm. that go all the way back. And so you can verify and validate that no transaction has been forged. Uh, nothing has been removed, and it really builds this immutable ledger that uh, that we're talking about here. And so uh, let's talk a little bit about how these different types of blockchains work. I've, I've been using Bitcoin as a good example, but there are others as well. Yeah, we could talk a little bit about uh, two different types. These are So let's talk about from the public sense, and then we can talk a little bit yeah. from the private side. Um, so from the public sense, like, like Derek had mentioned, I think it was 2009, Bitcoin had come out. Ethereum is relatively young. I mean, it was last year around this time, mm -hmm. around November, that uh, that came out. But essentially, they're two different models. Um, they're both using blockchain technology. So the, the concepts that we just talked about with how chains actually get created, very similar between these two. When you talk about Bitcoin, you're talking about what's called UTXO, or unspent transaction output. And we'll talk about what that means in the next slide and how that kind of functions. But really, think about it as a way to cal calculate your balance. Bitcoin was really created around a way for you to trade assets, essentially. Right. Um, 
there, there's a block inside of there, so there's basically an 80 byte uh, chunk at the end of these blocks that you write in a Bitcoin blockchain that allows you to kind of pack some other stuff in there, some data. And that's where people have leveraged it to do other things with Bitcoin. Right. Um, so if you look at the core, you don't really need to do a lot with that. Like Derek mentioned, you can sign a transaction that say, I want to take some unspent transaction output and transfer it to Derek, I, I as myself. And we can make that transaction actually happen through the consensus algorithm that's built into Bitcoin. Um, but if we want to do something more advanced and have scripts and different things like that, we'll talk about in some of our later slide decks, um, there is some features to, to enable You have that 80-byte you know. window to yeah. work with in each block. C compare that or contrast that to Ethereum, which it takes some of the great things about Bitcoin and evolves that into a, a, what, what we call a smart contract world where things are slightly more advanced and you have the ability as a first class citizen, instead of working it into that 80 byte uh, footer of the block, uh, the concept inside of a smart contract is it is a computational device. It is intended to execute or store uh, state. So it's more than just sending tokens or assets or money back and forth, you're actually going to be doing uh, some more advanced things, and I think that's what we're going to talk about with Ethereum. Yeah, so the thing to think about there, like Derek had mentioned, is, uh, you know, if you think about these Bitcoin or these blockchains, Bitcoin was really like 1.0, right? He was, this was kind of the first huge, and actually it's one of the biggest blockchains on the planet. And then Ethereum came out, uh, you know, relatively young, like I said, and, and like Derek mentioned, it doesn't just do pure state. So we think of it as kind of 2.0 on blockchain. And really what that means is we can have code that we can inject into there. So if you think about some of the technologies even inside Microsoft over the years, we did code signing and different ways for us to kind of validate and say, when I execute this piece of code, how do I know 100% sure that it came from this, this vendor? It right. came from Microsoft or it came from Derek. How do I know for 100% sure? And the way we did that in the past was we signed it using a CA and mm -hmm. a certificate, and there was a bunch of infrastructure to orchestrate that. This technology allows you to do something very similar. So we can build what's called smart contracts, which are basically executable pieces of code that allow us to store state on the blockchain, as well as interact with other things on the blockchain. So we can interact with other smart contracts. We can interact with other state. Um, so we can do things kind of inside of there. Now, there is some walls around this. Yeah. Um, in order to facilitate the immutability aspect and making sure that uh, people can't compromise the system and that it's totally deterministic. Yeah, and in, in the intervening modules, we're going to talk about some of the pros and cons of each of these two primary uh, blockchains. There are certainly others. Uh, this whole idea of a consensus or a distributed ledger has gained a lot of traction in the marketplace. Uh, and there are all manner of different technologies being uh, invented that uh, take from both blocks, uh, both from uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And so it's really neat to see what other kinds of, of chains are coming up, uh, up and coming here in the world. But what we want to do now is kind of dive in and talk a little bit about uh, the details around what is a UTXO versus what is a uh, what is an Ethereum smart contract. Sure. Yeah, so if we talk about UTXO that I was mentioning before, and this is primarily on Bitcoin blockchain, um, you can take a look at this, and basically what you can see is we have different transactions that are going to function through here. So if you look at my slide here, we basically have transaction zero happening here where we had some input, and then we had two outputs as a result of that. Maybe we already had some value in this chain, right? So we're saying, okay, I have some value here, and I want to transfer it to, in two different transactions. Maybe I'm going to send some, some Bitcoin to Derek, and I'm going to send some Bitcoin to somebody else. And so you can see those outputs actually go as inputs into the next transaction. So in transaction one, now that becomes an input for that. And you basically are building this chain of what are the transactions that are happening in here. If you think about it from like an accounting sense, essentially we kind of have to walk this whole kind of tree to figure out like what's, what's your balance. My, exactly. What is my balance on this chain? So if, I want, if he wanted to send half a Bitcoin to me and half a Bitcoin to someone else, those are two different transactions. They get wrapped into, uh, into a block and then whatever's left in your balance gets carried forward as an input to the next block. Correct. Correct. And that's, it's kind of like baked into the system, not kind of like, it actually is part of the system to enforce that uh, integrity of saying we can only use unspent output. Because the idea here is to avoid the double spend. And that was one of Bitcoin's big drivers when they first came out with this. You can think of when you're talking about distributed databases, which is really what we're talking about with blockchain, this distributed model of computing, what's the challenge you have there? Well, you're going to have competing transactions, right? Because we don't know where the transactions are coming in from. They're coming in from all these different nodes 
how do we co coordinate that? Like a distributed transaction coordinator almost. Right. How do we handle that and make sure that we don't uh, double spend? So if Derek has five Bitcoins and he transfers three to me and two to someone else and then takes that same three and transfers it to somebody, another party, well, that can't work, right? Because yeah. it's not going to add up. And so this is the model for avoiding that double spend. This is one of the ways that they're uh, kind of baked that into Bitcoin. And I would love to have five Bitcoin at this point. Uh, contrast that to uh, smart contracts in Ethereum. Uh, as we talk about uh, the, the transactions and the hashes from Bitcoin, in the Ethereum ecosystem, you have this, no, this concept of a smart contract. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I have a diagram here to kind of show this one. And again, you can see our blockchain represented on the right side here with all these different nodes. And essentially, somebody's going to come along and create a smart contract at some point. When they create that, they're basically going to, again, we're going to compile it on the, on the machine. So whenever they're building it, they have to compile it, make sure that it meets all the standards for whichever language they're using, right. Solidity, Serpent. There's a bunch of different languages out there. And once they compile it and everything's good, we'll go ahead and sign that thing. And again, now we've signed it. So now we have a signature that says Derek created this thing or Kale created this thing. And then we can basically submit that transaction, just like anything, into the blockchain. And when we submit that into the blockchain, it will eventually get processed as a transaction, and then it gets an address. And so now we have the address that allows us to interact with that thing. So is it a composite object itself, or is it its own special thing? It's, it's kind of like a special thing up there, okay. right? So you can think about it as an object that now lives on the blockchain, and it gets an address, right? Okay. And when I say address, it's just like a hexadecimal address. It's kind of ugly to look at. But basically what that means is now we have what's basically an interface to talk to that. If you think about in web services world, what do we do? We usually publish some code out there, mm -hmm. and then we tell people either through Swagger or through some other tool, this is how you use it. This is the interface. This is what parameters you got to pass in. Here's what methods you have up there that you can use, whatnot. This is the same thing. So we have what's called an ABI file that gets generated if we're using Solidity. And that creates this interface that allows people to talk to the blockchain. So what would happen is Derek would say, hey, I published a contract, Kale, and it's at this address. And the ABI is here, and you can go get the ABI, and you can say, oh, okay, I know how to interact with that thing now. I know what yeah, it's kind of like the it's kind of like the header, and inside that smart contract address, you're going to have a list of functions that you can execute on. And there are two different kinds of functions. You've got a read and then a write. Uh, reading is typically doesn't require Ether, and we'll talk about how uh, the financials of the Ethereum ecosystem work here in, in future modules. But you can read from uh, the state of the blockchain, and you can also write to the state by executing a smart contract, whether you're going to order a pizza or uh, sign an insurance policy or whatever the smart contract is there uh, designed to do. Uh, that's how you'll interact with it. Uh, and it looks very much like a web service call. Yeah, it's important to know what Derek had mentioned there about uh, the write versus read. So when we're talking about uh, uh, just a pure read operation on the blockchain itself, so go get all the nodes or get all the blocks in the blockchain and pull it down to my local client, doesn't cost anything from a sense, and we'll talk about what costing means here, like from an Ether perspective or, or Bitcoin. When you interact with these databases and you actually want to do write operations, you actually have to pay for that, right? There's a, because these were built in a public space, right. um, these are really funded by people who are using the system, right? So in order for you to execute something up there, you actually have to give us some value. Otherwise, you could just compromise the whole system and take over everything. But that also speaks to the real power of a blockchain ecosystem because you have an incentive for hundreds or thousands of different people to run their own node on the Bitcoin or Ethereum ecosystem, they get some value by providing compute power, but they also uh, provide the capability to secure that blockchain because the more nodes you have, uh, it doesn't scale perfectly linearly, but the more nodes that you have, the more secure it is because you reduce the probability that someone can impact 50% or 51% of all of the nodes and cause something else to happen like steal all their ether or execute this contract a million times, uh, that becomes less and less of a priority. And we'll talk about some of the design principles when you want to write your own smart contract, uh, things to think about here in, in the future. But you had mentioned something about you know, these nodes and they, they have this value. They're also doing something called mining. And yep. how does that work? Yeah, so in the, in the current space in blockchain world right now, uh, mining is very big. I mean, this is, it's called proof of work, so you might hear that term thrown around. And really what the idea is, if you look at this slide, we basically have our blockchain laid out here. And this could be, this is Bitcoin or Ethereum, it uh, doesn't really matter. Um, they're both using proof of work right now. Slightly different implementations, but the same model. And essentially what happens here is 
we have, as Derek mentioned, anybody in the world can come along and, and say, I want to put a node on this network. So right now, you could just go out and say, I want to stand up a Bitcoin node. Or I want to put myself in the public Ethereum space, and I want to create a node out there. And you could totally do that. So you pull down all the blocks. Now you, you're in sync with whatever the current fork is on, on Ethereum, and you're, you're processing, you could process transactions. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say you could process transactions, what's the incentive for you to put a node up there? Other than you saying, wow, this is really cool tech. I would like to see this work. Well, no, that's not real, right? In the real world, people actually want some incentive and money talks here a bit, you know, yeah. especially in the public sense. So you have to pay for that computer. It costs thousands of dollars for you to build that thing and put it online. And so when you say, I want to devote a node up here, you actually want to get something back out of it. So the incentive model that was originally created here was called mining or proof of work. What happens is, we mentioned before that these transactions are going to power up, and at some point we need to write a block. Now, who gets to write the block? What we do is say, basically, whoever gets to write this block is going to get some money uh, in the form of either Bitcoin or Ether in, mm -hmm. in the space that we're talking about here. So you'll get a percentage, and it's actually pretty big. You know, when you talk about Bitcoin or even Ether, you're actually going to make some money here. So what we say is we have to give you basically a really hard problem to solve. So we're going to give you a problem that's basically a hashing function that's going to require a tremendous amount of CPU uh, in order for you to figure this thing out. And it's, the algorithm is set up in such a way that it's really hard to find the answer to this, um, what, what math problem we're going to give you, but it's really easy to validate it. That's right. So that's the special property about this math that's involved here. So what happens is we say, okay, here's the challenge, guys, go do it. And all these nodes are now going to spring into action and try to do that thing. So they're over here grinding CPU, trying to figure out the answer to this thing. And then once they do figure it out, say, hey, I got the right answer. Then everybody stops for a second and says, okay, validate that. Kale says he's got the right answer. And if they validate it and they agree that Kale gave, gave the right answer, which they can do very quickly, mm -hmm. they don't have to do the same function again. They can just check the answer. Then they'll say, okay, yeah, he wins. Okay, he gets it. And each of these different algorithms, whether it be um, Bitcoin or Ethereum or one of the other uh, blockchain technologies out there, that algorithm or that, that uh, computation is optimized for one or more different types of hardware. So in the Bitcoin world, uh, it's primarily optimized for ACE hardware, so these things just spit out hashes left and right, hundreds of thousands of them per second. Uh, there are other t blockchains that are uh, optimized to speak to GPU compute, some are CPU bound, uh, and so it's really kind of up to the development organization of that particular blockchain to figure out what type of equipment is going to be best incented to provide that. And that speaks to the scalability. It speaks to uh, the community and what type of controls they want to have around that. Uh, but those are just some of the more esoteric things that go along behind the scenes. So real quick, before we wrap up this module, can we compare and, and contrast the two together real quick? Yeah, I think one more thing just to inject there on the mining piece. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier about like we have these public chains and then we have private ones. And we haven't talked too much about private ones. We'll definitely be digging into those in the different modules. Uh, because that's really the value that enterprises are seeing with the blockchain. Right. Uh, I don't think that the, the financial industry, obviously there's a financial side to cryptocurrency, which is Bitcoin and Ether. The token itself, the asset. Yeah, exactly. So there's a whole market built around that, and that's a whole kind of separate space. But there's also this space to say, hey, could we use the same technology inside an enterprise wall to do the same aspects that we're looking for? And the key aspects are these really strong security mechanisms right. with the keys, uh, the immutability aspect, being able to not be able to change it, this provides tremendous value in the auditing perspective. So if we want to do real-time audits, we can actually do that now and prove to an auditor that we didn't change it. Right. This is impossible to change it based on the math. Um, and the other aspect being a shared database. You know, this thing being essentially from a logical perspective, one big database that everybody's right. writing into, if you think about it from that sense. Now, obviously, there's a lot of restrictions around what yeah, we can do. Some downsides, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we'll talk through that. But I just wanted, I wanted to draw the corollary. And one of the things is mining that comes up. And mining is, you know, there's a lot of carbon footprint there, you can imagine, because uh, as Derek mentioned, there's specialized hardware. It's very expensive. It uses a lot of electricity to run. So these kind of things, when enterprises think about it, they say, why do I need to do that? Like, why would I issue challenges even if I'm doing working with Derek? Maybe we're two businesses working mm -hmm. together. Um, there's other algorithms that are being built, and actually some are out there right now in proprietary form. But, um, you know, if you look at some of the stuff that Ethereum's working on with Casper or Proof of Stake, uh, 
there's different proofs that are coming out to be able to do those kind of operations so that we don't have to do this heavy carbon footprint mining. Heavy carbon footprint, yeah. massive, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of nodes to require, uh, require to make it secure, those kinds of things. And, and again, we'll talk more about those uh, pros and cons in a future module, in a future module here. Uh, but I think to, to wrap up, uh, just take a look at this uh, last slide here where we're, we're kind of comparing uh, and contrasting the, the different types of Bitcoin uh, or the different types of uh, transactions. Uh, between a traditional one uh, in a database world where maybe you've got a, a SQL always on availability group, uh, where you've got two databases that are needing to be in sync, and so they are sending their transaction logs back and forth. Uh, in, a, in a blockchain world, uh, every node that participates in that chain has a copy of that distributed database or that distributed ledger, and they all have to stay in sync. And there are pros and cons, again, like we had talked about, around how those things work. But uh, it's important to know that, uh, and I think probably the biggest thing to know if you're going to be developing against a blockchain ecosystem is that, yes, it's asynchronous, just like some of the traditional databases can be, but that asynchronicity can be measured in tens of seconds, not milliseconds, because uh, that state has to be gathered from around the different net nodes in the network. Yeah, and I think the thing to take, to take away from this slide is really think about a distributed database versus a decentralized database. Big difference between the Big two. Big difference, yeah. So if we said in a traditional sense, we say how, when we're going to create a database where we're going to span it out, right? We're going to span this thing out uh, in a distributed fashion. We can do that today, right, with clusters. But the, the, there's inherent trust there between those nodes. Like we very, very tightly like know what those nodes are doing. So if Derek is a business and I'm a business, we're two separate businesses, but we want to work together. In order for us, to, we couldn't set up, if I set up a SQL cluster, let's say, for instance, on SQL Server, and I Your said, Derek, you're going to put a my, node. Yeah. You know, well, there's got to be some really tight trust between I don't want to let you them. on my domain to run the SQL, uh, the SQL environment. Whereas in a Bitcoin or, excuse me, a blockchain uh, infrastructure, um, I don't necessarily have to trust you. Right. And that's, there's a huge point there, and we'll kind of hit this as these modules go on, of being totally trustless, which is like the Bitcoin, Ethereum world, and partially trusted, which is these private chains, where we're basically going to have different nodes. So we have different admin groups. Right. Derek has his admins, I have my admins, and we're going to work together. We're going to build nodes but they're all going to talk together. So we can still manage it the way we want to manage it. Derek can manage it the way he wants to manage it. And we're going to come to a consensus around what the state of this data should be. Right. You know. Yeah, and we'll talk some more about those in the upcoming modules. Uh, for now, we'll close out this module. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll see you here in just a little bit. Thanks, guys. Welcome back to the MBA on Microsoft Blockchain as a Service. We're going to draw out some actual architectures here now uh, to kind of correlate with some of the lecture that we've given you earlier. Let's do it on our handy Surface Hub here. Yeah, so the first one I thought we'd draw out is we talked a little bit, Derek, about keys. Yep. And we talked that keys were very important to the blockchain and how we leverage keys. There's Actually, I see it as kind of two different kind of models for how we would do keys. So if we talk about um, basically, let's call this the fully decentralized. Don't misspell it. Yeah. There we go. And then we'll talk about over here, maybe this is more centralized, traditional. Okay. Pardon my writing with my finger, but basically what, what we would do here is we're thinking about, um, you can think about it as this is the client and this is the server. So in this case, whether this is a mobile phone or whether this is an actual like a PC, um, doesn't really matter. Could it but, also be a human? Could be, but uh, what I'm thinking about is where the actual keys sit. Oh, okay. The so, device itself. Okay. Exactly. So I mentioned before that uh, some of the folks in our, our partner solutions with like Uport are actually looking at this exact model right here. So basically being able to use the secure enclave inside of a mobile device to actually hold your keys. Now you might ask, why would I want to go through all that trouble? I mean, writing to hardware seems very specific to a vendor seems like it'd be a lot of work. Why not just put it in software? Right. And one of the big drawbacks there is OSs have vulnerabilities. Sure. It's a piece of software. Right. Uh, hardware chips are less of such because they're more simpler devices. We can kind of harden them a bit more right. um, and provide that increased security. So this could be a TPM device. It could be the, uh, the device we were talking about earlier. Yeah, we're even, uh, look, uh, you know, there's a bunch of vendors out there. You can go look at them, USB. Like an HSM module. Exactly. So they provide a little enclave there inside the actual hardware unit of a USB key. You could plug that thing in and then leverage that. Okay. 
So in this model, basically in our DAP, um, our DAP would, up here would be our blockchain, and we'll just represent that with a series of nodes here that are all connected. And we won't do full mesh here, but you, you get the idea. So here's our blockchain, and basically our DAP would have a client side, so maybe this is in JavaScript, for instance, and then we would have a server side okay. um, that's actually going to talk to the blockchain. This may talk directly through our DAP, through JavaScript, out directly into the blockchain, or we may have like a server component here, like an API or something that we're mm -hmm. going to talk to. And so in that model, it would just go to the API and we could do proxying there. Right. But the point is, we don't have to focus so much on securing this whole network, right? So this may be going over the internet. Sure. And in traditional sense right now, what do we do? SSL, because we're worried about somebody at man in the middle looking at what's going on in there. If you think about it, there's less impact here if you're actually signing data on the client. Because the data itself that you wanted to protect is already encrypted over here. Right. It before never it leaves, leaves that client. enclave. Yeah, and when, and when it does leave, it's already encrypted. Right. So the transport layer doesn't matter as much anymore. So I was always worried when we initially got started on this, I kept saying, hey, Kale, I'd, how can this be secure because it's talking over just plain old HTTP with you know RPC calls, but because it's already encrypted at the device itself, it's less of a concern that you also add the overlay of TLS and, and HTTPS on top of that. Right. Okay, so what about the centralized model? Yeah, in the centralized model, again, we're going to have our client and our server here, right? And so on the client side here, again, we're going to have devices, so let's say it is a phone and, and we'll do our laptop again. That looks really bad, but that's okay. Uh, and basically up here we could leverage stuff like, and, and you had mentioned this earlier, maybe something like Azure Key Vault, mm -hmm. right? And then again we have our blockchain over here. I'll just do it really quickly. So we have our blockchain there, and essentially we're going to make calls. Now again, we're going to have to secure the tunnel to get up to our service over right. here. And that's going to be SSL. Correct. And then we may have an API or something here that's wrapping this, so we're not maybe talking directly to Key Vault. Right. Generally a good, from a DevOps perspective, that's going to be a good idea anyway. Right. So we could basically have this thing proxy the calls to go get this. Now what's cool about that is the keys don't have to leave the key vault. Right. Right. So if we keep the keys over here, so the keys are actually sitting inside of here, we're actually making calls from our API, which is all on the server side, to go say, hey, go sign this data for me. Now the problem is the data was in the clear here, and that's why we have SSL. Right. And so what you're doing is it, you may gain some benefits of latency. You may gain some additional security enhancements by the fact that you can abstract this away from the client device itself. And but you also have the ability to, to make these devices, like uh, the phone or the PC, be uh, not instrumental in protecting the key, the hardware key itself. Correct. So it becomes a, this more, more utilitarian. Whereas over here in the decentralized space, you lose the device, you're in trouble. Yeah, and I think the other thing you could do here, this is more of a retrofit kind of thing. So you can think about this as we already have apps out on these. So we may have an iOS app or a mm -hmm. Windows Phone app. We may have some apps out on our PC. They don't necessarily need to even know about blockchain in this case. Right. right? They're just talking to an API or a, an MPC app or something over there. And this thing's handling all that complexity for us on the server side. Yeah, so you can see how there are some downsides and some uh, benefits to both approaches. Uh, it really depends on how you want to uh, architect your app and your solution. So real quick, let's also talk about gas. And we alluded to this uh, in the uh, other sessions, uh, but uh, can you tell me a little bit about how gas works, why you need it, how you execute on it, what does that look like architecturally? Yeah, so basically if we took a little diagram here and we said, okay, we have a, we have a user over here who's gonna interact, he's got some keys, right? So he's gonna do a signing over here. And then over here, we have our blockchain. We're going to get really good at drawing blockchains here, but... I was thinking getting good at drawing circles, but that's, that's another thing. <laughs> yeah, so here's our blockchain, here's our, here's our end user, and essentially what's going to happen is we have a contract that lives up here, right? Yep. So this guy already got uploaded by, by some admin at some point, may have been a user, may have not, and this has a bunch of lines of codes in it, and maybe it has like three different methods, mm -hmm. um, which have varying levels of compute and storage that they're actually going right. to be doing. So when this guy signs a transaction, so we have our trans right here. And we have an address, 0x. Correct. Some sort of address. So this guy will be referenced in here, that 0x address, just call it 111 or something. And then he's also going to pack along the params. Mm -hmm. Now what's actually happening the flow-wise is he's going to submit this transaction. That transaction is going to go up here, and obviously, again, 
it piles up in a queue. And these are what construct a block. So each of these transactions, you'd have a block at this layer. Right, so these transactions are piling up here. Eventually we say, okay, we got enough transactions, we can write a block. Uh, at that point, it's gonna recognize that maybe this was T1, okay? So he's sitting in here. This guy may say, hey, I actually need to operate on this guy. Here's my parameters, here's my uh, address for where I wanna execute it. Mm -hmm. The first thing that's gonna happen is it's gonna validate those parameters. It's gonna do type checks, it's gonna make sure you got the right parameters that you passed over. If you don't, it gets rejected. So the whole transaction will get rejected. Correct. Okay. And, uh, back to the other thing. This is asynchronous, remember, because we submitted that. So you're going to have to check back in at that transaction and see did that thing complete. Okay. And you're going to get that re error response that, uh, you know, about the parameters are incorrect. Or okay. whatnot. I don't know the exact one. Off the top it's of not at runtime, it's at block time. Correct. Correct. That's really, really important to understand right. here. Okay. Now you've already compiled the smart contracts, so you know it's sound, right. but now it's somebody calling it. Right. right? So once that comes through, then we basically, uh, when it's time to actually process this block, each one of these guys, like we said before, is going to go execute this thing. Now when they execute it, there's a, there's a gas that's involved. So basically, you can add more gas, but by default, what it's going to do is look at, um, you know, there might be, and I'm trying to write some pseudocode here with my finger, which is really hard. They have these pens here, they're really cool. Yeah. And then you'll have like functions. You know, and it's just typical JavaScript, and you'll have some lines of code in there. Right. But basically, each one of these maps to an opcode. If you think about assembly language with C++ or even MSIL and how that gets mm -hmm. compiled down when it gets run at machine code, this is the same concept, essentially. So we're basically like boiling this down and saying, here's the opcodes it takes to run this thing. And then it's going to, basically, it has a mapping table that says, this means whatever, 0.3 something in the gas or whatnot. So mm -hmm. they have weights. And in, and just for a terminology perspective, in Ethereum, gas is calculated in what unit of measure? Ether. In ether. Yeah. Okay. What technically it's actually in way. In but way. Yeah. Okay. So it could be this really long zeros and then a couple of numbers at the end. It's a good point. Um, so one ether, and I don't know. Again, we could we could drop that in, but equals like um, this way calculation we keep calling, which is. Uh, essentially a universal currency measurement. Mm -hmm. So it's not tied directly to ether. Um, this is the calculation, but it's like Derek said, it'll be a really long number. It'll right. be like zero, 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 0001, you know, really long. Um, so when you start working with Ethereum, you'll notice that right away. You'll be like, you don't have enough gas. Right. And then you figure out that it was in way and you start playing right. around with it. And so just to tie that up, every function or method in your environment, in your contract, is going to ha have a corresponding opcode that automatically gets mapped to it. They calculate all of that up together to the contract level, mm -hmm. and then when you execute the contract or a function on the contract, it's going to require some amount of way to actually perform that operation Correct. across all of them. I don't have to multiply it. It's, it's that one unit for the entire network. Yeah, and the interesting thing that you can get into here, like at, at, if you looked at a single smart contract, this makes sense, right? It's like pretty straightforward. We add up the opcodes, we got it. But like we talked before, this will actually be a chain of smart contracts, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's all kinds of paths that could, could, could happen there. If we have static paths, we can figure it out right away and say, right. what is it? But if we say, what if there's stuff that's like a recursive loop? Right, I want to do it in here, yep. and it's calling back over here several times. It's dynamically calculating Correct. the way based on all the options of each contract. So you could get it where it starts, and then it could run out of gas. And okay. you'll get an out of gas uh, error message when you see that kind of thing. And that's what you know what happened when you did that. Oh, maybe I'm actually calling some loop or Too something. Too much happening. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Well, that's a good, good overview, good architectural diagram of both key management and gas. I uh, hope you enjoyed this architectural drawing session. Talk soon. In this demonstration, we're going to walk through the Ethereum Consortium blockchain template. This is a template that was created by the Microsoft product group in order to make it easier to spin up an entire network of, of private Ethereum in your own Azure account. Now in order to do that, I wanted to walk through a couple things. The first thing is when you come up to the portal here, uh, the first thing you want to do is come up here to the top right and up here where it says new uh, is where we're actually going to click on. So we're going to click on new. And then we're going to type the word Ethereum. And you'll see a bunch of them come up and the one we want is the Ethereum Consortium Blockchain Template. It's right here. And if we click on that guy, um, there's a big description here about what this does.
I'll go ahead and expand that. So you can see a description about what it does. If you actually click on this hyperlink right here, let me zoom in so everybody can see that. Right here there's a kind of a hidden hyperlink. This actually goes out to a TechNet page that kind of has um, Q&A, um, so you can put your questions and things up here about the actual template. You can see some people put some things. You can also download a PDF here, which actually walks through the architecture of what's actually deployed here. It actually describes the template in, in very good detail, and everything I'm going to go through here, you can actually see there too. So if you want to do this offline, uh, you can actually do that yourself. But the first thing we want to do is actually click on this button down here uh, that says Create. So when we pull this up, there's actually going to be a, uh, a couple steps here that we have to go through to actually provision it. First thing is we have to give it a prefix, so we'll just call this demo. This is the uh, VM name, so this is going to be the username that gets provisioned to all the virtual machines that make up our network. We can choose whether to use a password or a public key. I'm going to use a password. But we have to give it a resource group. So we'll just name it RG, and we'll give it a location. Now once we've done that, uh, the next step here you'll see is network size and performance. And this is basically saying how many consortium members. A consortium is, uh, uh, you can think of it as businesses that want to work together. So in this case I'm saying I have two businesses that want to communicate, but you can see there's uh, a variety of choices here. You can go the whole way up to 12, which would be a rather large consortium. Um, and then inside the consortium, there's mining nodes and transaction nodes that make up the network uh, that will service the blockchain. And we can basically specify how many nodes we want for mining as well as transaction. And then we can pick our performance level of our storage. So if we want to use SSDs or hard drive, uh, we can also pick the high availability uh, and DR of our storage. So we're picking LRS, meaning we have three copies. We could also pick uh, GRS or read-only uh, GRS, which would basically replicate it automatically to a different zone. And then also we have the virtual machine size we could pick. But let's just take the default for this demo. Next we have the Ethereum settings. These are specific to when you're provisioning Ethereum. Uh, the first will be a network ID, and then we'll have an account password. Just enter a strong password there. And then we have to enter a private key phrase, which is going to be used when they generate our private key. So put that in. And that's all we need to do. So in this case, um, you're going to see it runs through some validation here. You can see it's running final validation. And eventually we should see a validation passed. Uh, and that's what we see right here. So we'll go ahead and hit OK. And this last phrase, uh, we're not actually purchasing anything, so the only thing that's going to be purchased is the virtual machines. So the the cost per hour of running those virtual machines is the only thing that's of pay here. Everything else is um, as free. So once we hit that, you'll see that uh, that pain goes away, and we actually see uh, deployment started now. When you're in the Azure portal, one thing you can do when you see these is you can click on this little bell up here. I'll go ahead and zoom in on that. You click on this little guy, and he'll show you if anything is actually happening right now. So you can see I have a deployment started here. And if you look inside of that, if you actually click on it, you actually can drill into the details and see things are actually starting to get created. So in our case, uh, a few things have already been created. It looks like we're working on our load balancer right now and um, we spun up some network components and, and some compute there as well. So it's going to take a few minutes here and uh, you'll see this thing's actually deploying. It usually takes between uh, three to five minutes uh, to actually deploy these templates. Okay, so now that we have our uh, template deployed, you can see there's a whole lot of resources that actually got provisioned for us, and this is kind of the magic of these templates. So not only are we provisioning some virtual machines, but we're also laying down all the bits that we need on there in order to run this consortium network. Uh, so the Geth client, we're actually doing some configuration with that. We dropped the uh, load balancer in here. Uh, we have VNets and subnets that were all created for us automatically, and if you look at that documentation, it actually shows how these things are all laid out.
Now, one of the things that we need to do is actually see this thing running. Now, the easiest way to do that is to look at this public IP here. Um, so it's one of our resources that's inside of here. And if we just grab that public IP address and put it in our browser, we see that we have a kind of a dashboard here and we can actually see some telemetry coming off of that chain. So this is showing we have one transaction node, two mining nodes uh, for high redundancy, and we actually show that these are the con in the consortium. So this is uh, consortium member zero and one, and uh, the block numbers are there. We actually have a way for us to mint ether. And so that's the next piece we kind of want to show is actually using this thing. So if we hit reload here, you'll see that the block numbers are going up. So essentially this is writing uh, empty blocks uh, because there's no transactions that are actually happening. But if we want to simulate a transaction, one of the things we have to do is uh, create a wallet and actually create an account and do some things with it. Now in order to do that, we need some ether, right? Um, so this uh, little tool here at the bottom will actually allow you to to fund an account with some ether. Now this isn't real, this is just used in a private setting, uh, so the ether has uh, no real monetary value in the real world, uh, but it works for our private network. Now the easiest way to do that, if you look in the docs, is to actually download this uh, component called MetaMask. Now I've already downloaded it, it's an extension for Chrome. When you click on this guy, walk through the provisioning, you essentially have to agree to the terms of service, you create a new vault, give it a password, You should copy and paste this into uh, a safe place. This would allow you to recover your vault in case you uh, lose your password. Uh, there's just a warning there. And then we have this account stood up. So this account is basically just created locally here. Now, one of the things we have to do is hook this up to what we just provisioned in Azure. So in order to do that, uh, we actually need to click on this. Uh, there was a little hamburger menu up here before, and then we're going to click on Settings. Once we click in there, we actually have to put the endpoint of where we actually want to go. Now, I'll zoom in on this because it's a little bit tricky when you first set this up. So essentially, we've got to put HTTP, and then we're going to put the IP address of the network that we stood up there. Remember that public IP we got? And then the port is 8545 for our PC. So hit save, and then we have to log back into this guy. Okay, so we're logged in. We have an account here now. I'm going to go ahead and copy the address of this account. Um, again, this is just a local account. And we'll pop back over to our little tool here. Now what I'm doing is dropping the address of that one. So what's going to happen is you're going to see it, it says I sent some ether over there. Now if we pop back over uh, to our account, you see boom there right away. Um, let me zoom in on that. It happened pretty quickly. When the mining actually happened, uh, we received our thousand ETH here. Now to, to further show uh, what we could do here, we could actually switch accounts here. And then we could basically create another account. Now this account's zero. So there's zero, let me zoom in on that. There's zero ETH in this account right now, you can see. We're gonna go ahead and grab the address of him. Now we could go over to our, our portal over there and, and put a thousand ether over here. But what's more interesting is we could actually start to transfer money between these two. So in this case, we could say send drop that address in. Let's just say we want to send 10 ETH over there. So once we do that, we then hit um, accept here. And after the mining operation happens here in a few seconds, you'll see this one actually drops to 989. And if we switch accounts and actually look over there at account 2, you'll see in fact that it actually has 10 ETH now. So this is kind of proven out that uh, our system is actually working. We have a network here. We're able to actually exchange Ether, so transactions are actually flowing through the system. And, um, you know, we can see our block numbers are up here. And, um, you know, once we have this kind of stood up, now we could actually start to build smart contracts. We'll show that in some of the later uh, demos, but this is a good start for getting your infrastructure ready. Um, this is running private Ethereum on Azure. Uh, you saw the single click deployment. Uh, very easy to get started with this, and so I recommend you check it out.
Thanks. Welcome back to the uh, course on uh, Microsoft Blockchain as a Service. And uh, we're going to progress through. This is Module 2. And in this module, we're going to talk about smart contracts. We call it Smart Contracts Explained. And really, what we're going to talk about here are some of the internals of what makes up a smart contract and how does this thing actually function in the blockchain. Which is good because I get a little bit of it. But as we go into this, uh, I'm going to pepper you with some questions because even I'm still trying to put my head around some of these things. So it's, it's good that uh, we've got you here to help go through these items. So let's dive in. Sure. OK, so from a core concept perspective, uh, we're talking about what is a smart contract. And uh, a couple things make it up here. I've kind of put out on the slide here. The first being it's a signed code. So we're establishing a clear owner. As we mentioned before, this is immutable and persistent. Meaning that once we sign this thing, and once we put that as a transaction on the blockchain, it'll live there forever. And it can't be deleted, it can't be pulled back out. How do you, like what happens if you have this smart contract thing that you decide you no longer want, or you were just playing around and it's there? That's a, that's a great question, Derek. So one of the things that comes up is, what do I do in this exact case? Like I said, I put something up there and actually I want to make a change to it. We can't change it, right, because it's immutable. So you have um, to be perfect the first time. So yeah, you just have to be perfect oh, nice. and everything will be fine. Okay. Uh, so, so actually what you want to do is when you publish these things, there's a couple different things to think about and we'll walk through some of these as we get into the more of the development and design okay. sessions. But decoupling some of the logic inside of your smart contract to make it more modular, that's going to help you because then you can just replace pieces of it. Okay. And, and that'll help solve that problem. But again, still, we're putting something new on the blockchain. So if we put a new piece of code, um, that thing's going to be new, and we have to migrate that old application and state everything that was in that smart contract we're now going to have to migrate. And I have to write all of this in assembly, right, or binary? Uh, you don't have to write in binary. We have different language, high-level languages right now. Okay. Um, so the most popular one being Solidity, okay. which is a JavaScript-type uh, language. So it looks very much, if people are familiar with ES, ES6 or any of the JavaScript okay. frameworks, um, it looks very similar to that. Um, it has some tweaks, obviously, for the language itself in order to do that. But the idea being, um, when we do have to replace those things, we have to migrate the data. It has state and code, right? And if we can decouple the state from the smart contract, that's one thing that we can do that can help us out a lot. So now when we migrate our code, we're just talking about the logic itself, not and the state. And when you talk about state, you're also talking about the data that, it may, uh, that it may be inside that contract. Totally right. So yeah, when we talk about state, uh, it's a good point. That's really like the data that we're talking about that we actually have stored up there in the blockchain. So in the previous module, we talked a lot about how you have these hashes, you have these blocks. Uh, how do these things execute? Where do these things go when you push them to the blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain? What happens then? Sure. So what, the way this functions and the primary platform for smart contracts right now is, is Ethereum. Um, so if we talked about Ethereum, essentially uh, there's an, uh, what's called an EVM or an Ethereum virtual machine that's actually going to run that code for us. So once we've published our contract, it doesn't execute it per se. It's just now put it on the blockchain and now it's there, just like a service for us to call. Um, so when someone comes along and says, yeah, I actually want to execute some code on that, they're going to create whatever parameters, so state, they're going to give right. us like some parameters and say, I want to call this method on this smart contract up there. It's going to get passed into a transaction. Whenever that block gets mined, when it says, okay, now we got to do that block, that's when the Ethereum VM is going to be spring into action and say, oh, wait, you got a smart contract you need to execute, I'll do that for you. So it can take some time between the point where I put my request in before that block gets mined and then this thing executes. But it's also important to note that when we talk about the Ethereum virtual machine, it's not like an Ubuntu VM spinning up behind the scenes. This is just part of the Ethereum code base uh, that when the miner uh, starts doing the work on that block, uh, that those parameters get executed against the logic inside that smart contract and then something happens? Correct. So you can think about it just like .NET, it's bytecode, right? So we, when we compile it, we're, not, we're compiling to almost like MSIL, right? We're compiling to this intermediate language, and then the EVM is going to actually run it in, in, in machine code, right? It's going to run itself out there, the opcodes. And just updates. like if I were sending a transaction or some money between us, I guess you've got to pay for that somehow. How Correct. do you do that? Correct. So one thing to hit before we get into the gas discussion is basically uh, I wanted to make clear that when these things actually execute, it executes on every node. Oh, um, no, so hold on. Move through that slide. Say that one more time. <laughs> yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, there's a delay, right? There's going to be some lag between the time someone submits a transaction and says, I want to call this thing. Right. It's going to be totally asynchronous because it's going to get submitted. At some point, we've got to mine that block. When we mine that block, everybody executes this because I can't have Derek 
Derek spins up a node, and let's say he, he has an EVM running there, right? So whenever the code it says, hey, we need to run this method, and here's the parameters, Derek's node will run that, and my node will also run it as well. And then we're going to compare answers and go, here's what I got, what'd you get? Okay, and then when you compare those answers, you assume that they'll all be the same, and that's what secures uh, that contract because you've changed the state, potentially. You are uh, setting new state, you're setting new transactions, you may be sending Ether around, uh, but uh, I assume then that in Ethereum, blocks have to be mined much, much faster than, say, for example, like Bitcoin, where you may have a block every 10 minutes or so. Yeah, and that's usually, that's the model for Bitcoin. As you mentioned, it's a 10-minute block cycle, so that's what they're kind of, there's different kind of knobs and dials they can kind of tweak from a difficulty perspective inside their system in order right. to facilitate that and make sure they stay within that 10 minutes. Um, the other thing is, like you mentioned, uh, with Ethereum, it's slightly different, so it's much faster. They're usually around 10 to 15 second block times. Oh, okay. Uh, much faster. Great. Um, and obviously, the smaller the network, actually, the faster it is, right, you can imagine, because we're going to have consensus build faster. But the downside to having a smaller network is... Security. Security, because right. if you have uh, too, many, too few nodes securing that blockchain in a totally trustless model, then bad actors or just bad code uh, can impact the stability of that blockchain very, very quickly. Uh, and so that's uh, some of the trade-offs that you want to. But, but back on this... How do you pay for having your sure. contract ex executed? Sure. So what's going to happen here, um, and if you look at this slide that I have up here right now, this is another core concept, gas, you need it. Um, so we have this concept of what's called gas inside um, Ethereum that basically says, okay, in order for me to execute, what's going to happen is the EVM is going to look at that bytecode. It's going to look at, like, what are you trying to call here? And it's going to be able to calculate, based on the opcodes inside of that, low-level code. It's going to be able to say, Derek just requested something that is very heavy compute. Like, it has to do all these different opcodes, all this different stuff up here, and each one of those opcodes is assigned what's called a gas value, or like, you can think of it as a cost. Like, it's going to cost you this much to do this opcode. So it's going to calculate that for the entire smart contract and say, here's what he's trying to call. I need this much virtual currency in order to execute this thing. Okay, and so this gas virtual uh, currency has to be spent every time you call your smart contract or execute a function on that smart contract. That's correct. And who pays for that? Whoever's calling the function is actually the one that's going to end up having to pay for that. So this is really cool. I can create this great business on Ethereum, and I can deploy my smart contract, and then it's up to other people that want to use my business to actually pay for it to run. Correct. Okay, that's weird. Yeah, so the cool thing about it is what Derek had mentioned was, like, you know, it's really cool that we can basically build a model and have it kind of scale out, so we're actually paying for some of that network because we uh, right. have gas that's involved here. But also, it's, it's a good kind of denial of service attack kind of, because it costs Guard, money right? to execute it, you want to prevent people from just executing it millions of times and bogging down the entire network. You could imagine if somebody says, wow, you got this really cool network out here, let me just slam it with tons of requests, a denial of service attack. Right. And if they don't have enough gas to do that, they'll eventually run out of gas and then they can't do it anymore. So it's a great kind of fail-safe there. All right, cool. What other kinds of concepts do we have to worry about when we're dealing with uh, these types of smart contracts? Yeah, so with smart contracts, one of the first things you're going to run into is there's different types of accounts um, that are established up there in Ethereum. Um, so when you're looking at, at, at Ethereum itself, there's actually two types of accounts. There's external accounts and contract accounts. Now, we've been talking a lot about smart contracts, and that's really what a contract account is about. If you think about what does that mean, it means, well, there's code there that exists on the blockchain, you know, that, that establishes what this smart contract is, and there's also an account where this this gas can power up, you right. know, other things we can use for that. So that's an account that can actually store Ether, so a state kind of thing you can think of there. From an external perspective, that's how humans interact with it. It could be devices as well, but primarily that's where we come in and we say, hey, we want to actually create a user account, you okay. know, to use this system. We have a key pair. We actually want to, like, match that up with a external account that's actually established on the blockchain, and that's how we can start to interact and kind of have our state. You know, if I'm working in the public space, that's where my Ether is. If right. I'm buying and selling Ether, that's where those transactions are going to be uh, coming across. It. And it's important to note that there's a very subtle difference between contract accounts and people accounts or uh, uh, external accounts. Uh, the external accounts are the ones that are going to hold Ether, but they don't hold code. You have a, a contract account, and that's what actually holds the byte code that executes whenever that address is called within that function. Yeah, and it's an important thing. We'll touch on this when we talk about some of the uh, off-chain components. But 
one of the things that might come to your mind right away is, well, if I compile code, and let's say I write a really cool function, and I put it up there on the blockchain, it's available for anybody. Right. right? It's bytecode up there. Somebody could decompile that and steal my logic. That doesn't sound good. Yeah. So that's, so one, thing to, that's one thing to consider as we go through this, and we have some kind of workarounds with off-chain in order to kind of help protect against that. So it's important to note that anytime you take, uh, you know, my, my brilliant business that I'm going to put out onto the blockchain, anytime you take that code and you stick it out there, uh, it's just bytecode, and somebody can disassemble that, and there's your logic. Uh, so it's like the ultimate open source repository. What other kinds of things do we have to worry about? I think balances and... Uh, we've also the immutability, which we I, I was kvetching about in the last module. But now you're, we're going to talk about some options. So it's out there forever, but there are some ways that we can control it. Yeah. So we have this module this way. Derek had mentioned early on in here about uh, what happens if I put something up there. Maybe it's total garbage. Maybe I was just testing something, or maybe I put something up there and I actually want to get rid of it. So we could migrate the state to a new smart contract, point our DAP or a decentralized app at that new smart contract, and everybody's happy, right? Um, but the old one still exists out there. So how can we basically put that in a state where it can't be called anymore, or it still exists out there, and we still have transaction history, but I don't want people actually interacting with right, it. Right, I want them to use my 2.0 or my 3.0. Yes, yeah, so we have the concept of what's called suicide inside uh, Ethereum. So we can basically allow the contract to kind of self-destruct, okay. essentially. And what we have to do there is basically take that account balance, whatever's up there in the contract, we have to get that out of there because we can't have that sitting in there. And basically then we'll make the code uncallable, essentially. Um, so everything still exists out there, the transaction history from all of time, ever since anybody's ever interacted with that smart contract, it will still be there on that blockchain. And people can actually go look at all that history and everything, but if they try to transact against it in a new one, uh, they'll get an error response back saying okay. you can't call that one. So. So I assume as I've got my, my brilliant idea that I've put together on my whiteboard and I want to develop this thing, uh, it's probably a good idea for me to know that there are some additional limitations that uh, are going to be relevant to our, our smart contract. So uh, what are some of those limitations that we need to talk about? Yeah, so I put a couple of these on the slide here to kind of get you guys, your heads thinking around this kind of thing. But you can think about it, it has to be deterministic. When we do things with a smart contract, we have to do them in such a way that they can be repeatable. because obviously as we were going through this, you know that um, it's going to execute on multiple VMs at the same time right. or slightly the same time. It's not going to be the exact same time. Um, so making calls external, calling an external web service is a no-no. So what? Time out. So what you're saying is that <coughs> my smart contract that I've put all this work into is isolated within the blockchain itself. It can't call out to get like a, a stock price or anything like that? That's totally correct. So in that model, basically, we can't have this thing making calls out to a web service because you can think about it. Let's say we had 10,000 nodes on our network, or even 1,000 nodes or 100 nodes. They would all end up calling. They that. would all call a web service, but it's going to be slightly different times. What happens if the web service returns something different for this node than this node? Then we don't have a good outcome. Yeah, because my stock price is going to change all of the time, and you have nodes from all over the world. So I can see why that's important, but from a developer standpoint, you're going to need to be very, very careful about how you architect your app because it's going to execute on all the nodes from what you're saying <coughs> and I can't call external services because I might get a different answer each time it gets called and it's all asynchronous. Yeah, and I think that the other thing to kind of hit on with Solidity specifically is these languages are relatively young, these high-level languages that we're talking about. So there's still ways to get yourself in trouble there, right? So it's a, it's a good thing and there's a lot of focus on this right now around this technology called formal verification. And being able to mathematically determine whether, you know, the code that you wrote is sound. Okay. Um, but also making sure that there's no bugs in the code because it's software, right? And there's going to be bugs in there, right? So. And in a lot of cases, when you're talking about these types of applications, at least out on the public blockchain, we're dealing with actual human dollars and, and, and other uh, currencies. And so if your smart contract is not developed properly, uh, it can be uh, fairly financially risky uh, because your smart contract could get hacked and all of the money that is being stored as part of the state could be uh, uh, transitioned off. So there's a lot of tooling there, but there's a lot of formal verification that needs to go into play there, um, and it can be costly. I think the thing to think about there, though, is you do have the real-time auditing functions. And we do have a lot of different constructs inside the smart contract. 
to kind of control the rate at which things can happen. Okay. Um, so those are kind of nice little gating points in there. And you, again, things to think about as you do development, and we'll talk more in the development session about this, but these are key concepts to really think about when you're doing it. Um, you know, making sure like you're guarding against these kind of bugs, looking at what the community, community has already developed in this space. Right? We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Right. We want to do the same functions that somebody else is doing. We can basically have things that have been vetted out there. So now that we've totally scared you uh, with how, how not to develop a smart contract, we're going to take a little break here and come back and we'll talk about some of the different use cases of where it would be a great idea to use something like a smart contract out on a blockchain. Until next time, we'll see you in a bit. Thanks. Welcome back to some more architectural drawings around blockchain. I'm here with Kale. And today we are going to talk about how uh, smart contracts and accounts uh, get created. And we'll also uh, spend a little bit of time talking about the different types of uh, designs uh, within the actual blockchain infrastructure. So let's go ahead and get started, Kale. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how we go about creating uh, smart contracts and accounts in an Ethereum blockchain? Yeah, I think it'd probably be good to start with the account section because that's one of the first things people are going to run into. They're going to say, how do I actually just start creating accounts so I can interface with this thing? Because like I mentioned earlier, you can easily come into Azure and spin up a, a blockchain, or you can use, you know, like Derek had mentioned, Docker to spin up a blockchain. Right. It's very easy to get the infrastructure running relatively. Right. Um, but, you know, once you get beyond that, you say, okay, now I actually have to use this thing. Right. Like, now, how do I start what, working? Yeah, what thing? happened? So let's start with accounts. So from an accounts perspective, I want to kind of touch on two different uh, models for that because we mentioned before that Strato is kind of unique in this space with the API. Right. So I want to kind of compare and contrast that with what we have going on in Geth, which okay. is the public and private uh, client that's very popular in the industry. Okay, let's dive in. So if we talk to about Strato, let's talk about that first. So in Strato, essentially what we're doing, I mentioned before, we have a block server that's running that's talking to our Strato instance, right? Mm -hmm. So let's represent our blockchain, and I'm not going to draw it out here again. We're just going to start calling it BC. So that's our blockchain. In this case, it's Strato. So essentially, we have an API that we're hitting against here, right? And then we're over here on our client side, we're going to have our, our DAP, our decentralized application, which is basically going to be talking to a block instance. Now, that, what's, what's kind of cool about this is the block instance can actually live on the client over here, or it could actually live up, you know, in the server up side. Up in the server side, okay. Right? So we could actually cool. stand that up here. Um, so we can is there a pro instance. or a con to which pattern you take? Yeah, so basically this is going to basically hold your key stores, uh, the stuff that you're working with. And when I say key store, that's where your keys get generated. Okay. So in Strato, essentially all you have to do is make a call to whatever your API is. So you're going to have your API, like your root URL, and then you're just going to name the account. So you're going to say, like in my case, it would be maybe... Maybe KLT is my, my username. Okay. And then I pass some parameters in my HTTP post. So this is just a straight up HTTP post. And it's gonna it's gonna post into this through block into our API. Mm -hmm. What's gonna happen behind the scenes is it's actually gonna generate a key pair for me. Right? So we're gonna get a public pair, a public key and a private key. Correct. It's gonna serialize that and in our block instance, whether it's here or here, there's actually gonna be uh, written to the file system. Um, a file, you know, basically with our stuff in it. Okay. So it's going to have uh, our public keys, our private keys, all those kind of things. Um, it's not. It's not going to have. It's going to have a derived key of our private key, so we don't have to worry about that that being shared or, mm -hmm. or being lost or whatnot. There's still a password involved. Okay. Is what I mean. Okay. So when that thing gets generated, one of the parameters you pass in is a password, and that will go ahead and create it. It's also going to give you a thousand ether, right? So you get started. nice of it. Yeah. So you got a nice little faucet there. I wish we could do that in a public space because we could just great. make lots of money well, and then yeah. we wouldn't have to do this anymore. Um, but <laughs> this is really cool. So we can basically spin that up, and it's literally one post code that you can do. And then you get all of that. And you have your, your account set up. Literally every time you do it, all you need to do is pass your password in and sign your transactions. Okay. Now, when we talk about, and maybe I'll do this with a little loop here. We'll just erase this guy. Okay. Well, we lost our thing, but that's okay. Uh, contracts, go over here. That's all right. That's okay. We'll, we'll redo it from here. So this is our accounts again. This time we're talking about what's called Geth. Okay, so first we we're talking about Strato, which is a blockchain implementation as well as an SDK and an API. Now we're going more pure open source, uh, go Ethereum from the Ethereum Foundation. 
Correct. Okay. So essentially, we have a blockchain, and if you remember, we talked earlier, this is JSON RPC, essentially. All right. So that's how we talk to a blockchain traditionally, mm -hmm. um, whether it's private or public. So over here, we're going to use Geth as a client. So it's a piece of software. Now, what's unique about Geth when you start getting used to this, you're like, the entire blockchain of Ethereum runs, runs on in Geth. that. It's a binary. Right. Like, how's that possible? Right. Like, it's one binary. One binary. It's got a <laughs> lot of stuff going on. So you can basically pass a bunch of parameters to this to make this thing. Mm -hmm. And then you can use this on your client side. To be a miner. To be a miner, to be just a pure client. You can uh -huh. make calls into your blockchain and okay. say, you know, I want to create an account. I want to unlock an account. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about this unlocking because this, this trips people up all the time. So when we first create accounts, yeah, remember the Genesis block, we have some accounts that get created in there by default. Right. right? These are our, like our minting accounts, the mm -hmm. first ones that we get. But we can also then start to come in and create other accounts in there, right? Okay, right. So when we create these accounts, the thing is uh, they're called personal accounts when we create them on the client side over here. Right, because we haven't talked about contract accounts yet. Yep. Okay. So basically when we create these accounts over here, we're creating that key pair again. We're going to generate a key pair. Again, mm -hmm. it's going to ask for a passphrase. All those different things are going to happen, and we're going to end up with this account over here. But the thing is it's going to be locked by default, right? So essentially up here, the account contract it's got read, created. It's read only. It's, yep. it's just, you can't use it. So basically, the account contract that lives up here, right? That thing is now sitting there. It exists. We can query it and see it exists, but we can't use it. So we start signing the transaction. You can read and say how much ether is in it. Correct. But I can't execute anything off it. I can't send any money out of it. That's correct. Okay. And so in this case, you're going to have to manage the keys yourself again. Right. So you got to manage all this. And in this one, you have to write a bit of code over here, right? So I mentioned Web3. And Web3.js, to be specific, is one of the most popular ones over here mm -hmm. to get started with this stuff. So when you get started with these blockchains, the first thing you're going to want to do is figure out what client library you want to use, this one being one of the most popular ones, and you can make calls on that. You can also make calls directly into Geth. So this is where things start to get a little muddy. Um, so okay. basically, you can do some stuff here that also crosses over, and you can do from here. But from a practical standpoint, a lot of the developer world is hanging out here. Correct. They're using this as either their client or they're minor, they're not actually making you know, tons of code that calls in here. You're really going to use it over the Correct. Web3. Correct. I see a lot of people just using Get to unlock accounts. So they'll come in as a developer and say, I just want to unlock this account so I can do these transactions and kind of play with this. Okay. If you actually look at the public code for something like Mist, which is a very popular client for Ethereum, you can download that. It's a, um, it's a GUI-based application. It sits right on top of Geth. It's really cool, yeah. It's basically a GUI for Geth. A GUI for Geth, okay, yeah. So it sits on top of there, allows you to do all kind of contract work, you can create accounts. So it's going to orchestrate a lot of this so you don't have to write a lot of code here. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, if you look at what it's doing, it's actually making a call to unlock it just for you to do a transaction and then it gets locked again. So contrast that for me um, between uh, accounts that contain Ether, uh, that are owned by people or things, uh, contrast that to a contract account. So th there's very little difference between the two, to be honest. I mean, the contract code and, or contract, the account contract, and, which is an external contract that we're talking about, right. or the actual smart contract that we have up there, they both contain a balance, right? Um, the only difference is that we can do certain operations on it. So they know the type. Basically, when we create that uh, contract up there, Ethereum knows the difference between an account contract versus a, an actual smart contract. And this is the subtle difference that we talked about in the first module is contract has code. Correct. Okay, so my Solidity contract that I'm going to write is going to go into a contract account. Um, it can contain Ether or no? That's correct. It can contain Ether. It can contain the Ether. Yeah. The, the difference is, is that an account contract cannot. It That's just correct. has Ether. Yeah, and if you think about it, the, one of the things there is we could actually, without a smart contract, transfer Ether between accounts. Right. We don't even need a smart contract for that. Think about Bitcoin, right? right? They didn't need smart contracts. That's right? just back we're, and forth. we're simply doing that triple entry that we talked about, mm -hmm. where we do, you know, escrow the money and that kind of thing. So basically, we would have two accounts, and we can do a transfer. So there's a special type of command you can call there called transfer to bring those over. Okay. So here in this last little bit, let's talk about how the architecture of an Ethereum network works, because I know there are a couple of different kinds of nodes that we need to work with. Yeah, and if you look, um, when we do our demos, we kind of talk through the templates that we have that we've kind of formed up there around Geth. So if you look at, um, it's called the Ethereum Blockchain Consortium, or the Ethereum Consortium Network is the template up there in Azure. If you go up and search for that, you'll see that. Now, 
it's very easy, like we mentioned here before, to just take yes, right? And pass some parameters to it and start standing up nodes, right? Mm -hmm. And building your own little private network, right? Right. So maybe this is node one, this is node two, this is node three, right? It's very easy to kind of spin that up. Mm -hmm. But we think, you know, what we were thinking is it's a bit more non-production, non right? right? This is really good to just get this thing stood up. It's just some nodes. Right. But there's not really a lot of rhyme and reason for that. So if we looked at what can we do inside of Azure, we could say, well, some things we want to expose to the public. Right. So literally facing the Internet, it's got a public IP address on a specific port. You touch it, and you have the ability to do stuff inside the blockchain. Right. And so when we form a consortium, and we use that word, I hope we haven't really defined it, but a consortium being a B2B type transaction, right? right? So right. we can form a consortium of N number of businesses that want to col collaborate together and share some data through a blockchain and work together with that data. Okay, so they would have maybe business B is over here, and it has a public interface, and it's talking like that. Correct. So inside, basically what we would have here is we're going to have a series of nodes. So, um, from a standpoint of this, we would have. Sorry, there you go. Yeah, we would have basically um, transaction nodes and mining nodes. Right, so these will just be nodes up here, just like we drew over here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so briefly tell me the difference between a transaction and a mining node as it relates to sure. our consortium. So the mining node, again, we talked about the mining operations earlier. These guys are just going to be crunching on that data and actually minting blocks. That's their whole goal in life. And this is for proof of work. Correct. Okay. So these guys can be totally private, mm -hmm. right? So that we don't we never need to extend those out to the internet. Now we have our transaction nodes, and the transaction nodes are the things that are gonna absorb transactions as you come through. So you might put a load balancer in front Correct. of that. So we usually put a a load balancer here, and then maybe people from the outside, maybe your DAP. So your MVC or your ASP.NET app would go in from there, or a mobile app. Correct. Anything that's going to use your leverage your stuff, it doesn't need to talk directly to the miners. The miners don't even need to be exposed to the internet. The only thing that needs to be exposed is an endpoint to allow you to communicate with it. But these are all talking to each other. That's correct. Okay. So think about it as front tier, middle tier. Right. Very cool. And these guys can be kind of private. I mentioned I have that little slash in there, but these guys are really sitting on a VNet upside inside of Azure mm -hmm. with a load balancer that we're selectively choosing what to expose to the internet. Standard Azure load balancer in front, and then you can connect your consortium together on the public space. And something that I found really interesting was is that these are communicating over HTTP. They're they're not. It's not TLS. It's not encrypted. The data itself is already encrypted and therefore you have a fairly high sense of security around that. Yeah, and another thing to kind of touch on here, when you start spinning these networks up, we haven't talked about it a whole lot so far, but peer-to-peer. -peer. Mm -hmm. So these networks that we're building up here, when we talk about spinning up these nodes, whatever we're spinning up here, these guys all communicate through peer-to-peer -peer, uh, protocol. Okay. Right, so basically there's a discovery protocol that actually happens there inside these systems. So when you go standing these nodes up, they're going to find each other. You have to inject certain values first off to say, hey, where do I go get my bootstrap? Like, where are my boot nodes at? How do I get started? Because these guys all know, maybe, maybe these guys already know about the blockchain, right? They all know, they're already synced, everybody's in sync, and we add a new node for some reason. Right. When that new node comes up, he has to know where to go to say, hey, I need to pull the blockchain for this. So we're going to have things like network ID, correct. the Genesis, Genesis file, and then these would be seeds. These guys here are like my pointer files to get to the network that I know I want. If I left those out, it would probably take a really long time to find them. Yeah, and in the public space, I'll touch on this real quick because there's a lot of research and a lot of work going on in this space. Um, you think it's a simple process to do discovery, but it's yeah, not. It, um, yeah. When you think about the public space, um, the, this is what these blockchains were built around. You don't want to actually have, like if these nodes are in close proximity to each other, that's cool. So if we spin up a new node and he sees that based on ping time, I got a node right next to me, I can use that guy. That's fine. But he also needs to go get a node from really far way away. Way away, yeah, absolutely. This way, somebody can't plant a bunch of nodes right next to you and compromise your system. Right. Because they might be able to just like hurry up and plant a bunch of stuff right near you, then they could change the way your node works. Absolutely. You know? Very good. All right, so that shows the architecture of both uh, contracts and uh, uh, the network design themselves. And uh, we hope you enjoyed this architectural design session. Talk to you soon.
In this demonstration, we're going to talk about block apps and specifically the block product. Now, there's some dependencies here. We need to install a couple things in order to actually use block, so we'll walk through what's that mean. But you can think of block as kind of an SDK to talk to a blockchain. Now, this talks to a specific type of blockchain, and that blockchain being Strato. So, Block Apps has created a unique blockchain offering called Strato, and the kind of the difference or the unique characteristic of it is that typical blockchains like we've been looking at with Ethereum actually use uh, JSON RPC as a protocol to actually talk to the blockchain for, you know, for instance, for entering transactions on the blockchain. Uh, Block Apps took a unique approach to this and said, could we stand up and build a REST API in front of a blockchain that essentially allows developers who already have experience with web services and enterprise development experience to be able to easily grasp this technology and start using it. And so you don't have to learn a new protocol or any of that kind of thing when you're using this product. So what we'll do first is lay down that product and then we'll talk about Block, which sits on top of it, that enables, enables us to create applications on top of that. So the first thing we need to do is come into the portal and actually provision an instance of Strato and you just come up here to the top where it says new. You click on that guy and you type in Strato and I'll go ahead and zoom in here and you can you can actually type blockchain or Strato or whatever. It'll come up like this so you can see that we have that Strato thing there and we'll go ahead and, and hit enter on that and then we'll get the results and here it is. And we'll go ahead and expand that. And basically, this just describes uh, what the what the instance does for you and how to use it. And then it also has links to their developer API documentation and examples and whatnot. And if you want to go ahead and spin one of these up, all you have to do is click on this little create thing down here in the bottom right corner or left corner, and fill in the parameters like what machine name you want to use, what usernames you want to use, and and what size you want. Uh, once you have all that spinning up, and I've already done this, you'll have a machine just like this um, that's running in your account. And um, it's a Linux Ubuntu box, uh, has all the Strato bits already pre-installed on it. And the only thing you really need is this public IP address. Um, so you'll take note of that because we'll use that in our configuration file later. Great, so once we have that all stood up, the next piece we need is actual block that we've been talking about. So block is a is a node-based application. So you can come up to the NPM repository and look for block apps dash block. Uh, go ahead and it has uh, some documentation about how to use it. We're going to walk through some of these demos now, but to actually install it, you basically just do a global install of block apps. And the last piece you would do then is go into wherever you want to create your project at and run block init. Now it'll prompt you, it'll ask you for a couple parameters, like what do you want to name your application, and what's your Strato endpoint, like your IP address we mentioned before. And other than that, uh, it'll go ahead and scaffold out a project for you. Now again, in the interest of time, I've already set that up. And so I have one called MVA Demo here, and it's empty. So this is what a base app looks like. In my config YAML, I'll go ahead and zoom in on this. You can see there's an API URL here that basically points to my Strato endpoint. And so remember my IP address there, yours is going to vary, so that's what you would enter there. Now, once we have all that uh, configured, um, that's really all we need to do. Uh, I want to show you a couple things around here. So in the app folder, there's a lot of code here that actually is infrastructure to make this work, but one thing that's kind of cool is we have this contracts uh, directory here that has a bunch of smart contracts in it. Now these smart contracts are written in Solidity, and uh, these are just some examples of multi-contract, uh, multi-signatures, simple storage, so just some starter applications to kind of get you going, smart contracts. And uh, we'll come back to that in a second when we actually want to go ahead and start creating some smart contracts on the blockchain, but the first thing we want to do is actually create some accounts. So we're going to pop over to a command line, and all we need to do is just run block gen key. Now if I put new parameters in there, it's basically going to create me an account for admin. Um, doesn't have any special permissions, it's just an account, and it just happens to be called admin. We'll go ahead and put a password in here, and you'll see that it wrote a file out here. Now, uh, you'll see this long string of alphanumeric characters here, .json, and if you actually pop out here um, to, your, to your IDE, you'll see that there's a new folder here called users, and I'll go ahead and zoom in on that so you can see. You can see there's a users folder now, and the admin's in it, and you can see a long string of alphanumeric characters again. So if we click on that, uh, basically, this is all the uh, salt values and the encryption. It actually has a, an encrypted version of the private key here. It has the address of where this thing lives on the blockchain. So all the stuff that makes up those, those key pairs that you 
generated there on your client. Now the address you can see is right here. Um, so it starts with 011A and you can see this starts with 011A so in fact the name of the file is the address on the blockchain. So now we have an account out there that's cool. If we wanted to create other ones I mean we could just say block gen key uh, test user let's say. And again we're going to be asked to enter a password of high entropy and I'm going to use the really strong one of test right now. And basically you can see that one got mined as well so we created a external account essentially on that blockchain and here's the address for that. And again if we pop back over here into the users folder you can see we now have admin and test user. So super simple to create accounts. Um, I don't know how it could get any simpler there. When you start working you know, with blockchains, one of the first things you run into here is generating key pairs and external accounts and unlocking and all this different uh, features you have to do just to actually start to interface with it. So the team here has done a great job to make that really easy to actually start interfacing with. Now, that's cool that we've created those uh, external accounts, but we actually want to create some, some contracts, some smart contracts on this chain. And I'm going to walk through one of the really simple ones, which is the uh, simple storage. Now I'm going to walk through this function. This is the actual smart contract, uh, Solidity code. It looks like JavaScript, um, so it's got a lot of the same features. And you can also see that basically we have a state variable here that we're going to keep in our contract that's going to store a uint, and then we have a setter and a getter here. Obviously the setter is going to accept a parameter that's going to use to, to uh, update that stored data, and then getter actually returns that data. What happens is we compile this locally into bytecode, and then we turn around and sign that and put that as a transaction on the blockchain and then the contract can live in the blockchain once it's mined. Then users can come along if they know what that address is and execute the code inside of the smart contract. Now the way that they would do that is create a transaction and pass in parameters. How do they know what parameters to pass in? There's a, there's a simple format that gets created when we compile this called ABI. So the ABI actually lays out like the interface and says we have a setter here, a set function, that accepts one parameter that's a uint and doesn't return anything. And then we have a get uh, function that doesn't accept any parameters but does return a uint. Um, so that's kind of like an interface uh, description of what's happening there. So again, back to our command line. If we do a block compile, simple storage, and we don't have to put the uh, the extension on there of .sol. What should happen here is uh, we do a local compilation of that, so you can see the source code there, and then it actually uh, wrote out uh, to this meta folder. So if we come back out here again, look in our meta folder, you'll see we have our simple storage.json, and there's the actual binary, um, and here's the ABI that I was mentioning before. Um, so you can take a look at that at your leisure, but basically it's describing what's happening inside of there, and there's our binary. Now that's just local, right? So we've just compiled it locally, but we actually want to put this thing on the blockchain so we can actually use it. So one of the ways we would do that is we would just do block upload, simple storage, it's going to ask us for a password, we're going to go ahead and put that in, and you'll see that we actually created uh, the simple storage up in the blockchain and you can see there's the address it actually lives at now. Uh, if we pop back out to uh, this interface you can see that we now have a couple documents describing it. We have the actual source that we have, we have the one that lives in the blockchain, and then we have the latest um, because we could actually rev this, right? So as we create more versions of this thing each time it's going to change the address uh, of what happens up there uh, or what lives on the blockchain. Now, this was through the command line, but you can think of this, how would I interface with this from an application? So what I have here is Postman, uh, which is a tool that allows you to interact with REST endpoints. Now, we don't have anything listening here right now, so what we could do is just say block start. And after a few seconds, you see, uh, let me zoom in on that so you can see what exactly it says. So basically it says block is listening on port 8000 and then at the bottom API is pointed to and then it has our API endpoint. So cool stuff, we have a little listener now running here and over here then we could start to make some REST calls. So let's just say we go to localhost port 8000 slash users. So what this is going to do is basically enumerate the users that we have on our local instance here and in our case we have admin and test user. 
Now, if I forgot what the address was for admin, I could actually just type in admin there, and you would see we get the address back. And if you check that with what we have over there, you would see that it's the same thing. Now, we could also create users like we did before. Um, so again, from our code, you can imagine that we could do this in our code too. We could say demo user, right? So there is no demo user right now. But if we create one, and all we have to do in a body that's uh, URL encoded, we pass two parameters. We'll pass a password, and we'll just call this test. And then we pass a faucet, which basically allows us to give it uh, some ether, right, by default. So it's going to give some ether in order for us to execute uh, code on the blockchain. So if I click on that, you'll see basically I get an address back because it just created a new user up on the blockchain called demo user and you saw some stuff flash by over here you can actually see in debug in the console um, the actual rest calls coming in so now if I come out here and do a get and say users I should see three users and you can see that we can actually see three users a and you can imagine that we can do this with the entire API set so with contracts we can manipulate upload contracts uh, we can do all that stuff from the rest interface which makes a really good interface uh, when you start working with this from your application and so uh, that's the demo on block apps and getting started with it I hope it was helpful for you the documentation is all up there on their uh, NPM page so you can take a look at that and you can also review this video if it helps you thank you Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the third module of our blockchain uh, talk here. I'm with uh, Kale Teeter and I, uh, Derek Martin, and uh, let's review real quickly where we are in our agenda. Uh, starting uh, up on this session, we're going to talk about uh, decentralized apps and architecture. Uh, but first, since we broke on our last session, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the core use cases around where blockchain technologies uh, might uh, make a lot of sense. So this first one is... Use case, uh, the use case around this first one is called provenance. It's where we have both parties in, an, in a transaction have decided to validate the ownership of something. So I own a fence, and I'm going to sign that I own a fence, and then the guy that has the title to my land, he's going to sign that I own that fence. And we uh, put that onto the blockchain as I own that fence. And then eventually, uh, that gets uh, uh, signed by both of our public keys, uh, it gets recorded to the blockchain, and now it's out there for anyone to be able to validate. And at some point, I may need to go and sell my fence uh, or sell my land. Again, remember in the first module where we talked about how uh, you can have multiple composite objects build up so that you have different pieces uh, of, a, of a, whole, uh, a whole unit. And so that's the, the use case around provenance. So, so what, where these things really come to play is when I think about a smart contract, I'm thinking about how we can write in code what's actually happening in the real world. So when we think about um, you know, a transaction that's going to happen, if Derek's going to sell me something, he can't obviously just give me money, because what if I just take off with his money and don't give him the object? And the same thing, I can't just transfer ownership of an object to him without him giving me money and me validating that he has enough money to actually pay for it. So when we talk about the, the use case of provenance, uh, we're talking about uh, any contract that would happen in the real world. In my first example of, of selling my fence, uh, it could be selling my cows, you can tell I'm from Texas. Uh, and the idea is, is that you have to embed that provenance into the, the construct of the, of the contract itself. So I think that's a, a great idea. The second use case uh, around uh, provenance is when I need to change ownership of it. And so what we have here on the, on the slideshow is we have two different transactions. Both parties signed to validate that a change of ownership is going to happen in exchange for a token or a currency, uh, just like uh, what would happen in an escrow service, uh, triple enter entry accounting, those kinds of things, is we would both have to sign, that asset would change hands, and then the new state reflects that ownership after the transaction has occurred, the ownership has changed, the currency or whatever token has been traded out uh, has, has occurred. Yeah, and totally, it fits in the same model, you know, what we were talking about before, where we have uh, now a piece of code that's actually handling the validation or the escrowing function, essentially, for us. Right. To make sure that, A, somebody has enough money to pay for if it's a financial transaction, but obviously we can use blockchain for other things beyond financial, but we, that's an easy one to think of. Okay, we're going to store some value up here, 
We're going to escrow that until we make sure that the ownership can change hands correctly and then we'll release the funds to their correct owner. Nice to take the middleman out. And that third concept around, uh, or that third use case that we're going to look, at, look at here is around tracking. And Kale, can you tell us a little bit about how this one works? Yeah, and you can think about this use case really around like a retail system, maybe like a track and trace type system. And really what this is around is uh, the concept I mentioned in the earlier module, module one, when we were talking about how we do digital signatures and we have complex objects. So we have these composite keys that are made up of all the components that are inside of those. Really what's happening here is we can have a transaction that, or a contract that's basically going to keep track of the state of that object that we have up there. And the idea is that now almost real time, we can have people querying into that system. So when you think about a supply chain, for instance, mm -hmm. those components typically for a product are coming from all over the place, right? There's some coming from different countries, different regions all over the place. These pieces are all coming together to build a, an Uber object, essentially. Right. And that thing's going to be sold somewhere, so it's going to end up being transferred to somebody. Eventually, they're going to own that object, and it's going to have all these pieces that made it up. Well, what happens if, like, right in the middle of, uh, you know, the supply chain, something goes wrong with one of those components? How do we do it now? Well, the problem is with, like, in the, in the supply chain right now, there's very complex systems because... There's different parties that all have their own databases, and they're synced. You know, we say they're in sync, basically, because they built integration to keep track of, okay, when I sent you this part, here's a batch of parts that right. I sent you, right. and you're keeping track of that, but those things are never in sync. Right. So if we think about the shared database model that we get with a, a blockchain, or that kind of aspect that we get from a blockchain, this is really cool now. Now we have one central point that we can just like query into and say, what's the state of of this component. And it's a single source of the truth, and it's also important to note that uh, that shared database or that shared ledger, it is not um, something that you're going to expect to run a query and get a response back in milliseconds. We're talking about tens of seconds because sometimes some computation has to happen. Uh, other, other factors may go into play like network latency, but those are typically uh, issues out on the public blockchain. So what we want to do now that we've talked about some of the different use cases is switch into more of the, the private blockchain and uh, talk a little bit about blockchain as a service. And I've got a, a slide here where we talk about how does all of this work with uh, blockchain as a service from Microsoft. And what it allows us to do is uh, inside the Azure marketplace, we have uh, a set of templates that have been designed that will allow us to deploy uh, different uh, flavors of blockchain technology, which you can then wire up with different Azure services, whether it be identity with Azure Active Directory, storage with DocDB, uh, a lot of very powerful reporting uh, components with Stream Analytics and Power BI. But obviously that core chain technology uh, exists down on the infrastructure layer, and it ultimately is just a series of virtual machines. I keep joking with Kale that it would be great if somebody would uh, come up with a way to put a Bitcoin node in Azure Functions, uh, because then it wouldn't require all of the, uh, or an Ethereum node in Azure Functions, so it wouldn't require all of the uh, underlying infrastructure. But there's a lot of active development going on now. You can run an Ethereum node in a Docker container, uh, which is uh, fully supported out in Azure with our uh, Azure Container Services. So uh, what Microsoft is doing is providing a uh, central repository of all different types of uh, blockchain technology that organizations can get started developing their dApps with. So let's transition now here just a little bit and talk about what is a dApp. So we've, we've introduced some of the core technology around hashing functions, around keys, uh, and what all of these things do out on the ledger. We scared everybody in the last module of, of some of the bad things that can happen. But let's look here at this slide here around uh, ADAPT and what it is. First of all, we talked in the previous uh, session that it's backed. Uh, its back end will be immutable and persistent. It's not great for general data platform to be used with all types of data. There's, there are specific types of transactions and, and database uh, constructs that are going to be great for it. However, that doesn't mean you're limited to those types of things. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about uh, off-chain type things where uh, you can store some persistent data for non-trivial data. Uh, that can be in Azure Storage, in Azure SQL Database, uh, DocDB, Mongo, anything that you can think of. Uh, it's also important to note that key management is crucial. Uh, I had an example myself uh, as I was practicing uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, I lost my private key to uh, a, a, block, a blockchain uh, ecosystem out on the, the, public, uh, uh, the public chains, 
and I no longer have access to that asset because I lost my private key. So it's important to make sure that just like a PKI or a CA authority, uh, you want to make, make sure that you maintain uh, good control over those private keys. Yeah, I'd say this is one area, especially from the enterprise perspective, but even in the real world, like you mentioned, talking to public blockchains, uh, key management is the most probably the most important thing, right? Because everything that we do through this chain has to be signed. Right. And it has to be signed with a set of keys. And if you lose your private key, there is no recovery mechanism. And so um, inside of Azure, we talk about some of the different security features like Azure Key Vault uh, that make great examples of where you can store those keys as part of a security attestation service where your chief security officer actually has access to generate those things, keep them in Key Vault, and then issue them back out depending on how you write your DAP. Uh, so that uh, the private keys all stay uh, in nice, cozy, ensconced area. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of tech and, and innovation happening here. Uport is another one from the consensus guys uh -huh. that they're yep. working on. That is, uh, if you can go take a look at that, you'll see what they're doing there is trying to leverage and, and keep the keys a little bit more out at the client level, so not centralized keys, so they'd be totally decentralized, and um, still provide a model for key recovery. So if you take a look at what they're doing, there's a lot of innovation happening around how do we provide a model, even though keys are, you know, it's immutable, like we can't, right. we can't uh, recover keys, we could put proxies and things in place there right. to make that kind of thing happen for an enterprise. That's right. And so all of those things have to be taken into account. Now let's talk about how you might scale um, an adapt. So these decentralized apps, they're going to scale in different ways. It's, it's not going to be a traditional uh, environment. You're going to need to rely on that consensus algorithm, and, it, and it's going to run in a time-bound fashion. It's not going to be sub-second or millisecond when you do these transactions. Uh, soft forks happen all the time, uh, and block depth can, uh, can impact your application. There's, there's some, yeah, Kale, dive into that just a little bit. Yeah, I actually wanted to dive in on the first point there okay. to begin with. Uh, basically, um, what Derek was mentioning is totally true, right? So when we start talking about working with blockchains, it's, it's asynchronous, as we mentioned before. And, and the more nodes you get in there, essentially, to some extent, it'll be slower. Right. Um, and that's one of the key points, I'd say, when people start getting working with blockchains, and you'll see more in our demonstrations, you don't need to spin up a massive network in order to build a DAP. Right. Um, it actually makes sense to have very few amount of nodes that when you start building DAPs. And we're talking about an enterprise environment where uh, you're in your own trust model, so you're not having to worry about uh, each of those different nodes being compromised. That's correct. And the idea is that you can take your time and develop that kind of offline, we'll call it, basically in your own private chain. Right. And then you can take your assets that you've built after you've tested them all, and then you maybe take that to the public. Um, right. So that could be a model. So the thing is, you probably don't want to develop up on the public one. Um, now, there's different spaces to test. There's a test net that's out there in the public space that allows you to test stuff, but it's not real. So like the ether holds no real value in right. the world. Um, and then what Derek mentioned is totally private, which is where kind of blockchain as a service shines, because it's very easy to come in, and we call it single click deployment, but basically fill out a couple parameters, and you can have different types of blockchains running there. We have, you know, the guest stuff with Ethereum, mm -hmm. we have Strato, and we have Chain.com. We have a bunch of different ones up there, so you can kind of pick your poison and spin that thing up really quickly, come back to it, and start writing your dApps, right. you know, on top of it. So back on this slide here, as, as we start thinking about um, additional things that can uh, impact the scalability of your application, we're also talking about how soft forks and block depth, so it can take some time as your chain gets older, uh, your blockchain uh, ages, it can actually take some time to get to that state. It's going to scale pretty well, uh, but it is something that you want to take into account. Modeling of your network with mining that's required to make it fair for all members. So that if, uh, if we're in a business-to-business a -business relationship, I've got five nodes, you've got five nodes, that works out really well. But in, in a business-to-business -business relationship, if, if it's, it would be unfair for me to say, well, I'm just going to run one node, and you're doing all the bulk processing, so you have to run five nodes. And there's a trade-off between how that happens and then, obviously, uh, what takes place when those, uh, when and, those code And the uh, idea execute. is there that even though we do have a partial trust because we're engaging in a business-to-business -business transaction, um, Derek probably still doesn't 100% trust me. He, he semi-trusts me. So he'll say, okay, we're going to go into a relationship together and we're going to have fair nodes, right? So he's going to have five nodes, I'll have five nodes. Now, if all of a sudden I say, no, I want to have ten nodes and you have five nodes, I could control majority now. Right. right. So you could I, break I, my 
If I injected something weird into my EVM and said, actually make the transaction happen this way, I'll always win because Derek knows they'll come up with a wrong answer, but I'll have more right answers, so I'll say, okay, I win. Yeah, and so it comes back to how the structure of uh, the blockchain is very, very important. And we've been kind of harping on this, but it's, it's really key to, to understand. And we talk about it here on the next couple of bullets here. Uh, after you establish identity uh, and making sure that you've got a good, strong encryption model, it's important to note that more nodes doesn't make it faster. In fact, it can actually make it slower. So you're not increasing your computational power by scaling out. You're increasing your computational power by scaling up. Uh, and so if you're, you know, in Azure, you've got a, like a DS2 uh, going to a DS12, that will increase your computational power. But adding a dozen more nodes won't because, as Kale taught us in the last session, every single node actually executes that code. Um, and also, considering what data and or logic needs to be as part of the smart contract and off blockchain versus on blockchain, that's a key design criterion, and there's a few discussion points that we want to spend some time on here, uh, Kale, and talk about what kinds of data would be good for off-chain and what kinds of data are good for on-chain. Right. So, I mean, the big thing there to consider, in, and we're going to walk through some slides here about some other, a couple other concepts, but one thing to consider is this is not, we've been mentioning it as a database. It's not in that sense. You can't think about it the same way that you think about a database. Yeah, today. it's not a SQL database. Reads and writes, sure, but reads relatively quick. Writes can be seconds, minutes. Uh, if you're over on Bitcoin, it can be hours. Mm -hmm. So it's important to know that uh, when you're having things on chain, plus you're also uh, bound by, like if you're in the Bitcoin network, you're bound by that 80 byte uh, inside of a block. Uh, you have to consider, if you're going to be storing terabytes of data, you probably don't want to do that on-chain. Correct. And the other thing to consider is uh, gas. So we mentioned in the earlier discussion when we did the smart contracts in Module 2 that gas is kind of important here, right? We're going to figure out these opcodes. Well, you can imagine that, let's say we store tons of data. Let's say in our application, instead of having a bunch of smaller smart contracts to do our work, we just put everything in one big smart contract, and we have all our state in there. And then all of a sudden, we have to change something. When we change it, we have to migrate. Remember I said before, we have to migrate that state to the new smart contract. You can't do that for free. There's actually that, an opcode to move that a, data. There's an opcode that yeah. requires gas, yeah. and so it can be relatively expensive. And so if you imagine, uh, I wrote a smart contract that stored cat pics, and I've got all of these pictures on chain. Now I want to uh, introduce a new function onto my smart contract for uh, dog pics. Uh, I would have to move all of that data uh, from my old one to my new one. And if you're talking about, you know, a few bytes, great, no problem. You're, you know, less than a fraction of a cent. But if you're talking about terabytes of data, then it can become very, very expensive. And so as we talk more about on-chain versus off-chain, on-chain becomes really good at storing uh, cryptographic hashes, storing uh, logical state, signing the actual back-end data store of the off-chain data so that I can store my cat pictures and my dog pictures or at the beginning the provenance and pictures and, and the, the plat map of my fence or my cows or whatever. That can all stay out in Mongo or in DocDB or, or things like that. So those are just some of the, the key concepts to understand around uh, the, uh, the uh, DAP, off the off-chain storage and, and uh, key concepts around the DAP that you're, that you're wanting to work with. So we're going to take a break right now and uh, go back uh, and uh, get ready for our next module. And uh, we hope that you'll join us uh, here when we talk about DevOps. So take care. Welcome back to our architectural design sessions. I'm Derek. This is Kale. Uh, this session we are going to do some architectural designs around off-chain storage how they relate or contrast with oracles and cripplets, and then we're also going to talk about some scalability uh, considerations with regard to your blockchain. So uh, let's start in uh, real, real succinctly, if you don't mind. What is the difference between uh, an oracle, a cripplet, and off-chain storage? Because they are all off the chain. So what is the difference between them? Uh, maybe design, draw out how they are architecturally different. Sure. Yeah, so let's talk through offline storage first. Um, maybe what we can do is basically define what these, what, what all these are, and then we can, you'll see the differences between okay, those. Okay, yeah, two. let's do that. 
Yeah, so if we talked about, let's just label it here, offline storage. Offline, off-chain. Oh, yeah. Not, I'm, I'm not sorry. on the chain. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, make it off-chain. Because it might necessarily, mm -hmm. might not necessarily be offline. Right. So offline storage, okay. So off-chain storage, basically what we're talking about here is the model that we talked about before. So when we're talking about storing things up here, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum, we definitely have to be cognizant of how much data we're storing in there. We can basically break up the data contracts and have a bunch of little data contracts holding data. That's one model that we could use. But there's still severe limitations around that. Right. And the blockchain's not really built to kind of serve as that function. It's really about the ledger function at, the, at, at its core. Being able to prove that something uh, originated from somewhere. It Providence, happened, yeah. it exists, you moved it, that kind of stuff. Don't put your cat pictures in there. Right. Okay. So basically, we have this big ledger here um, that we've been talking about, and this is our transaction log, for lack of a better sense. You know, so this is our trans log, uh, just like a database, and that's what we're keeping track up there on the blockchain. Now, as we start bringing data in, like, okay, this here is our smart contract, right? We got this guy on the blockchain. He basically, instead of storing all the state in here, which we totally could do, you can start right. storing state. Eventually, you're going to hit a limit. Um, to what you can store in there. Because it'll just get slow, it'll be too hard to upgrade expensive. because you, it's expensive. Okay, right. yep. So the thing is, we can basically just bring, and I'm just going to use a database symbol here, but this could be NoSQL, this could be file systems, this could be Azure File Store, right. you know, it could be blob storage, mm -hmm. it could be any of that Anything. stuff. So just consider this a, a repo out here that we can store stuff in. And essentially, whenever we're writing into our smart contract, instead of just writing into here, we can basically write our transaction into our data store and then calculate the hash off of it, right? So now we have a hash. Okay. Whatever. So we have a hash over here that we can use, and then we can basically sign this with our key so we know who the, the owner was of this, right. and then we can basically have that as part of our state in our contract. So this would ultimately build up, as you were querying back your state, this would ultimately build up that tree of being able to prove that this data exists on your blockchain, but the actual blob or the binary bits of it are sitting down in your database, so you're proving that that data has both been signed and has not been altered and that kind of stuff. Yeah, correct. And the thing to think about there is the verification is what you're looking for there. So when we have this digital signature um, that we have referenced in our smart contract and also in our transactions history, you know, everything mm -hmm. that's built up, we can actually prove when things changed and, and to that extent all those kind of things. But the actual data itself is, is abstract to us. We don't really care what it is. Okay, so now explain to me how that relates to either an oracle or a cryptlet. Sure. And in the cryptlet sense and in the oracle sense, both of those, the, those uh, mechanisms are there to provide us two things, off-chain compute and off-chain storage. Okay. Um, the problems, we, talk, we kind of talked through the pros and cons of oracles versus cryptlets earlier, so I won't mm -hmm. rehash this that. This is the 1.0. This is the 2.0. Yeah, you can okay. think of it in that sense. Um, but essentially, we can build oracles on top of cryptlets, so it's kind of a superset okay. you know, when we think about it from that sense. But it's, what we want to do here with these oracles versus cryptlets is to be able to say, like, I, I don't want to have, like, crazy compute over here. One reason, IP protection. Because this is all public. Everything okay. in here is in bytecode and can be reversed. Yep. Okay, so... Essentially, if I understand what you're saying here, is an oracle or a cryptlet is providing, like, compute power sitting up in the cloud that we talked about how they're attested or they're, they're verified. So I could have off-chain storage holding all my data. I've got an oracle or a cryptlet providing extra compute power. Both of those help to reduce the amount of gas as well as the overhead and increase efficiency possibly increase security because this is in bytecode, uh, which can be easily reverse engineered, and stuff sitting up here would not be exposed to the general public. Yep. I, and another model that flows with this is basically so the when you say that it's more secure, we still have to trust our Oracle, right? So we had right. some we had some issues around that. But Cryplets is attempting to solve, you know, some of that to some extent to be able to say we can run that securely up there. But being able to offload that also gives you the better transactions per second, which is a big thing with blockchain. We haven't talked a whole lot about scalability, but transactions per second, because it's asynchronous and because we have to wait for this block time, it actually is kind of an issue right now compared to some of the systems we're used to.
sub-second, you know, transaction times. Right, yeah. right. So over in Bitcoin right now, you can, there, there are times when it's 20, 30 minutes for a block gets, uh, gets confirmed. Uh, in Ethereum, it can get that big uh, on the public network. On the private network, it's a little bit different, but it could be as, as painful as that if you have a B2B scenario where you have multiple members in the consortium spread out all over the world, uh, just speed of light gets in your way. So uh, that actually dovetails really nicely into the, the scalability conversation. So let's... Yeah, one thing before we touch on that is uh -huh. uh, I wanted to talk about Cripplets. One other feature that we're actually we're looking at there, with Oracles, remember, we're coming in. So we're coming from the outside into the blockchain. We can call in. Mm -hmm. One of the features that we're trying to do with Cripplets is basically be able to annotate these things. So, you know, in .NET, when, uh, I'll just use .NET for an instance, but Java does the exact same thing. If we have a function definition, and then we can provide in brackets above that these attributes, right? Right. About something. You're decorating it. Correct. So we can use these annotations to actually index into a cripplet. So we can say, mm -hmm. hey, when you execute this function, the variables that you're going to use, actually, I want you to go get them out of this thing. Okay. Uh, when you go to execute this function, here's the code I want you to execute first. You can delegate actual calls over to this cripplet and have him go do some compute for you and give you a result or just give you some state back. So that really provides a way of separation of concerns. I mean, you're, you're putting the compute elsewhere, you're putting the storage elsewhere, and you're using the blockchain for what it's really good at, triple entry accounting. And, and anchoring, right? Anchoring. And, and anchoring, that's yeah. right. You're going to attest that that data is valid or that compute is valid. Correct. Okay, great. Cool. Scale? Yeah, from a scaling perspective. Scale, Kale. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one of the things we talked earlier about was scale. Um, you know, adding more nodes to the network doesn't obviously make this thing go any faster because... Uh, it actually makes it slower. Because they actually have to coordinate and, and resolve this issue. But one of the things I wanted to touch upon was like an enterprise. So this is what we're kind of focused on with these private blockchains, especially the enterprise market. What kind of unique challenges are we seeing right now from a, it, looking at the mining that's happening out mm -hmm. there right now, even if we spin these templates up we have right now? So one of the things you can you got to be aware of when you start setting these things up is... So we could spin up, and I'll say this is consortium member one, and this is consortium member two. We'll just say there's two up here right now. So these are two businesses, two different networks? Correct. Or, okay. So maybe this guy's running on-prem. Mm -hmm. And this guy's running in Azure, right? Of course he is. So basically, this guy says, I want to spin up a bunch of nodes, mining nodes, and let's say there's three of them. And this guy says, I want to spin up three nodes. So now there's 50% here and 50% here, mm -hmm. right? So no matter what happens, as, as Derek was mentioning, when the confirmations actually happen for the transactions, neither one of these guys can take over the system. And right? that's simply because they're sharing the same amount of compute, they've got the same amount of voting power. Correct. Okay. Even if this guy spins up, you know, bigger machines, and this guy has slower machines, right. there's still 50% here, you know. He may get the blocks, he may get the incentive, we don't care that much about incentive in enterprise. Not an enterprise one, right. right. So these could be huge VMs, and these could be little bitty ones. Right. Okay. But still, they got to have 50% from each. They can't they have to have 51% in order to, to have it. Okay. Right. So if we, if we had this model, and then we say, okay, well, what happens if this guy loses a node, right? So what happens if this guy goes away, and okay. now he's down to two? Well, now the percentage has dropped, right? right. I don't know the calculation there, but this guy's going to be less than 50%, and this guy's going to be greater than. Oops. And I did them backwards. <laughs> you did them backwards, yeah. Sorry about that. That's so right. this guy's going to be greater than, and this guy's going to be less than. We're very excited about our surface head. There we go. So cool. essentially it's lopsided now. Uh -huh. If this guy wanted to kind of subvert he could be the bad. system. Yeah, he could be bad and take over the system. It's just something to kind of think about as you start laying these networks out. And mining's kind of um, hard to do in the enterprise right now because it doesn't fit the same model. Now, proof of stake and some of those algorithms that are coming out, and there's other algorithms that uh, companies are developing to change the consensus algorithm so we don't have to have the, the mining aspect. Yeah, because essentially in an enterprise environment, this is a, a very uh, computationally unfruitful exercise. Uh, you're basically having these VMs run at 100% CPU uh, for 24 hours a day, so you've got a higher carbon footprint, you've got uh, a higher infrastructure cost, you've got, you know, whatever the case may be, if, if it's I.O. bound, uh, that can be really expensive. So 
changing it over to a different type of mining algorithm in the enterprise space like proof of stake and some of the other ones could be very beneficial to an organization so that they don't have to have such you know, esoteric mathematical calculations going on behind the scenes. And we've been talking about proof of stake for a while, but just from a super high level, to just give you a sense for what that means, instead of having to compete through this mining operation to this you Who know, finds game, the hash fastest? We basically, in that model, first. you have to escrow money up front. So okay. everybody is given a certain amount of virtual tokens, let's call it, and each company can use those tokens to say, I'll process that block. Okay. But obviously, there's a limited amount of those, so somebody can't just take over the whole network and say, I'll process every block. Right, because when you create that genesis block, <coughs> you initially allocate X amount of, in this instance, ether. Mm -hmm. And it goes to the initial, so in a, in a proof of stake, just real briefly, in a proof of stake uh, al uh, algorithm, you would assign X amount to one node, X amount to another node, and then they would have equilibrium. Right, and and then there's it gets more complex from there. You can imagine that once you use some of your ether, you have to wait so long and these kind of things. The gas and then yeah. the trail. Yep, yep. Okay. So that's just a kind of a super high level of like what we're talking about there to kind of help this mining operation, so that we don't have to do mining as much. And and these things are evolving. I mean, this is a very fast changing space. Um, so we're going to see even more come out. I'm sure in the future. Yep. So hope you enjoyed this architectural drawing, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Okay, in this demo we're going to talk through an actual real-world decentralized app, or DAP, and um, we have a fictitious uh, pizza company here, so we're going to show uh, three parties engaging in a transaction, um, and we'll actually show how that can be orchestrated with smart contracts in the Ethereum chain, and in this case we're actually using Strato as the backend, um, so we're going to be using uh, that as our blockchain, and then we'll be using block at the middle tier, and then we'll have our dApp built on top of that. So in order to get up to speed with this, first thing we would need is obviously Strato uh, for our backend blockchain. And I have an instance running here already. We mentioned this earlier. I'll do it really quickly. Uh, essentially, you just click on the new block up here in the top left. Click on there. Type in Strato or blockchain. Either one will bring up a list of results here. And then we can click on uh, Strato. Again, we have a description about what it does. We have all the documentation for Strato. So when you start working with it, and if you click on the Create button down here in the lower left corner, um, you can actually get an instance of it and start running with it. I have the instance already provisioned, so we're good to go there. Uh, and then on the Pizza app, uh, the DAP itself is up here in GitHub. Um, so you can come up here to this location. And that's block apps pizza demo. So in here, um, you can download all the code, and they have nice kind of walkthroughs for different environments, uh, Vagrant or Azure or whatnot. So you can come up here, take a look at that stuff. This is where the bits are to get the thing running. Uh, and I have that running on this machine here, which also has a block instance on it. OK, so let's, uh, let's dive into the app here and see how this thing actually works. So if we pop open a browser here, and this is my endpoint on port 9000. Uh, right here is our Azure endpoint. And so, um, again, it's a bit of a contrived example, but it gets our point across. So we have three parties that are going to be working with this transaction. We have a buyer who's actually interested in, in purchasing a pizza. We have an oracle who's going to be a third-party intermediary who's going to decide between uh, who gets paid uh, based on the outcome. And then Pizza Maker is obviously the guy who's minting the pizzas. So if we log in as the Pizza Maker, you'll see right now that he has a balance of 1,000 Ether. He's got a, some open and closed uh, offerings here right now. He actually has a pepperoni open here. Let's go ahead and create a new one, and we'll make a sausage one, and we'll make that for five as well. So when we click on that, we're actually basically creating a contract. So you can see here, here's the contract address out on the blockchain. And um, here's the balance that's on there. There's nothing in there right now uh, because nobody's funded it. The price is five, and uh, you know it's a sausage pizza. So if we log out of here and log in as the buyer, you can see we can see all the contracts as well. So we're just enumerating those. And you can see that we have a pepperoni and a sausage available. So I'll go ahead and pick the sausage one. Uh, and I'll say, yeah, I want to go ahead and fund this. So I want to buy this thing. So when I say I want to buy it, it's going to say, well, you need to sign that transaction. Remember, when we put any transaction on the blockchain, we're signing it. So we'll put in our password. And then that's it. So you can see up top here, if you looked really closely, 
the buyer actually had his balance decremented by five. Now, the if we log in as the pizza maker right now, he, he didn't get paid right away. So the, the contract balance is actually holding that five right now. So at this point, I do have the button here, but we're gonna ignore that for a second. What would typically happen is a, a, a pizza delivery man or whatnot would come and deliver the pizza. Now, you know, you can imagine in the future maybe an IoT device that's tracking the location of where that pizza delivery guy is that he actually dropped the pizza off. We could verify it that way. We could ask the end user once they receive the pizza to uh, enter something on their mobile phone or something of that re nature. And so the Oracle could be automated in that fashion. But in this fashion, we're just, we're going to act as the Oracle. We're going to act as a business logic. Um, so basically, we could come into uh, our sausage here that's been funded. Uh, you can see the buyer funded the pizza contract. The contract balance is five uh, because they basically uh, escrowed, you know, five of this virtual currency to buy this. Um, and then we could rate the satisfaction delivery. Now, if I click happy um, that it's been delivered and the customer's happy, then the maker will get paid, the guy who actually sold the pizza. And if I click unhappy, uh, the buyer will get it. So let's just say he's happy. Um, and so the contract paid the pizza maker. And so if we go look at the pizza maker now, at his balance, you'll see that he has 1,005 ether now because he got paid for that. So this is just a simple example showing how we can orchestrate a uh, triple entry accounting, um, showing that we people don't have direct control of that because you can imagine in a world where if someone just automatically gave the money directly to the guy who's selling something but he never delivered the product it would be hard to get that money back and thinking about these things in the future if you think about you know larger retail stores or online stores that you buy things through you're actually going through that process too right you're using your credit card and saying I want to pay for this and you know essentially there's some level of trust there that those people are not just going to run away with your money and not deliver the product or give you the right product. Uh, and, and so the larger companies always win there because they have a lot of uh, clout in the industry that that a reputation that they, they're not going to rip you off. Uh, in this case, we can make it more real time. You know, as the product is actually delivered, um, we can actually like trigger it based on business logic, uh, like I mentioned, IoT devices or, or something of that nature to actually trigger it to release the funds to the correct uh, parties. So I hope you get a sense of what a DAP actually looks like. You can look at the source code behind this. Um, very, It's out there on GitHub. You can play with it and actually modify it uh, for your uses as well. But it's a good way to kind of get started and understand how these DAPs work. Okay, well welcome back to the MVA on Microsoft Blockchain as a Service. We're going to continue on here in our agenda with the DevOps side of blockchains. And so I'm going to kind of walk through some of the key concepts that you need to consider around the DevOps type scenario when you start working with blockchain. How do you actually use these things in the real world as opposed to uh, just talking about the development and maybe the theory behind the scenes? We want to know how do we actually you know, operationalize these things right. and run them in an enterprise. So one of, the, one of the core things is around how do we actually manage this type of technology. It's a totally different in some cases uh, than we're used to, right? We're used to versioning things, we're used to you know, release management and deploying things in that model. Um, but we got to consider some special things about uh, these type of decentralized applications. We've kind of harped on it in a lot in a, the earlier modules, but the, this, the ability to be immutable, you know, these smart contracts is a key concept. Um, that has to be considered when we're doing code migrations and as we're deploying things up to the blockchain, as you can right. imagine. Uh, if the address changes for our blockchain or for our smart contract, we have to make sure our DAP is pointed. Yeah, they're hard linked. Right yeah, yeah, they're hard linked in. Yeah. Um, the other thing to consider is, uh, and this comes up a lot when we start thinking about adding nodes, if we're going to like, you know, maybe increase the scale of our network or maybe even decrease the scale, um, we need to think about uh, what's called the genesis block. We haven't talked about this a whole lot yet, but when you start up one of these blockchains, one of the first things you have to do, or the first thing that you're going to have to do when you establish a blockchain is create a genesis block. That genesis block is going to contain the core, basically the root of your blockchain. And it's said that, you know, basically he who controls the Genesis block controls everything. Okay. So if you are in control of the actual Genesis block, you can change some certain parameters about that blockchain. In Ethereum, you can change things like gas limits and these different things in there to kind of control, you know, when Derek was mentioning earlier about like lots of storage in a smart contract or really complex logic, you can actually make it so big that it won't execute. 
right? Because it would require too much gas. Okay. So you can still kind of put those, that's kind of where you can kind of tweak twist, things. Twist the knobs to make it efficient. Exactly. You could say, hey, I don't want really complex code running up here because I'm only running on D2s. And that's the way I want it. Right. I don't want people running you know, big things. And I don't want them storing lots of data up here, this kind of thing. So you can kind of control that to some extent. Um, the Coinbase is what generates the first block, the first address when we're up there. And we can also have it generate the first accounts for us. Because obviously when we start a blockchain, somebody has to own the first Something, one you know, yeah. that we get started. And then it's just going to basically spread out as we add more external accounts as we were talking about okay. um, and transfer that around. And, and when you think about Ether in the, in the private sense, this isn't on the slide, but it's something to consider when you're doing your Genesis block, is that, you know, in a private sense, Ether paying for gas and things doesn't matter as much as in the public space, right? We talked about mining and all those things. And typically what we do is actually just give people, you know, we can move Ether around in a private network. So in order for you to use gas, you could say all my business partners get this much Ether right now. And if they want more, they can come over here to this faucet and get more. Right, but you can also use the, the gas limits in your uh, code uh, and on your blockchain to make sure that other development teams that might be injecting into the, the private chain are only able to consume X amount of resources Correct. before they have to come back. So it's a good throttling mechanism Correct. in a private blockchain. Totally, totally makes sense. It's something to consider when you start building these applications out. The keys used to sign the transactions on the blockchain are tied to unique actors, obviously. So when we generate those keys, they're either tied to a device, it could be an IoT device, it could be uh, a human uh, in many cases who are actually going to use the system, it could be a proxy. Um, we could do something on the server side and have it actually talking to the blockchain. Right. Um, in, in some cases, we, we don't necessarily need to expose all of this technology down to the end user. Right? They might just see a web application. People talk about dApps all the time and think that it's like some Star Trek thing you know, that's out there where we're it talking about... It sounds Star Trek-y. Yeah. yeah, but it's like... You know, no, it could look just like the applications that you're familiar with today. Okay. Um, and that's, I think, really the goal, to make it pervasive. I mean, we can't have uh, people, I don't want to have my mom managing her keys, you know. Because Generally it's not. Because be really no. hard for her. So I could, create, I could create an MVC app in front of a DAP, and the DAP is just more of the, the middle tier layer. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So we could do it in that model. So there's different ways to kind of architect and build these things together, and we get into the kind of drawing sessions, the architecture sessions, we'll kind of draw out some of those for you. Okay. Um, the release management process, obviously, has got to take uh, into consideration migrations as well as dependencies. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Truffle. You know, so Truffle is a uh, very popular, mature product out there that does a really good job at saying, hey, we have nested smart contracts. We'll talk about that again, too, but let me just hit on it right now. We actually have a slide to kind of show this. Essentially, from a core concept, if you look at what a developer is doing, if you look at this slide, uh, a developer sitting down, he's building a smart contract, he's going to deploy it to the blockchain. We've been talking about that you know, through all these modules. But that's kind of like the really simple use case. That's not really real world. When people start building more complex and real world applications in these, we're decoupling some of the logic inside of there. So now smart contracts have dependencies on other smart contracts. Okay, so you build this chain and uh, each different function or each different piece uh, or business case can be uh, its own smart contract, but you also have the ability to have uh, multiple instances of that smart contract depending on what you're trying to accomplish. That's correct. And you can think about, as Derek mentioned, that maybe like a chain, lack of a better term, but like having all these dependencies between smart contracts, if we change one in the middle, everything, everything that's dependent to, on that right. now has to change. So having a tool, a DevOps tool, to actually do that for you is really key. Like it really helps when you start getting complex ones. When you're doing one, two contracts, yeah, it's easy to maintain. Right. But when you get really nested ones in really complex scenarios, it can actually be really hard to figure out. Like where and That's where those hard going. links come back in. You want to be able to easily manage the hard links or the addresses to all of the smart contracts, particularly in a versioning scenario. Yep. And right. there's, a, there's a couple different frameworks out there. Embark, Truffle, again, we'll talk about them. But those are really popular ones that can do a really good job at this for you. They can actually kind of script around that, and it helps in a DevOps sense. Um, you know, from a smart contract sense, again, we're talking about, and this is just driving home the point of when, once we create a smart contract and we hash it and we have it up there, it gets invoked. That's a simple use case. When we start decoupling the logic from the data, we mentioned this earlier, um, this is kind of a key concept. We can build a library, for lack of a better term, of the smart contracts. So once we build the function that does uh, an asset trade, 
We don't need to rewrite that 100 right. times because we're, then we're going to make a mistake. It's just software development 101, right? We right. don't want to keep rewriting the same thing. We're going to make mistakes. The idea is create that in a self-contained like little unit. We can actually reference that and use that in many places. Now we can harden that thing and make sure that it's really good and then we don't have to worry so much about like uh, a code bug or something causing a problem up here. That's where a lot of the formal verification comes back uh, and the efforts underway now to help the code that it gets written to be formally verified so that we know that there aren't um, little bugs in there where somebody can run off with all of your ether or all of your Bitcoin. Um, I have this uh, uh, funny comic on my desk that says all the JavaScript that was ever written has already been written or ever needs to be written has already been written. Um, that's not quite the, the way it is right now with smart contracts, but you can assume or, or get the impression that uh, there can be an ecosystem of uh, you know, Solidity contracts out there where you can say, I need to do this. Well, here's the best practice on how to do that. Uh, and you can grab that code and, and work with it and, and make any changes that you want. Yeah, and we're actually working with some partners to actually integrate some of their solutions around that, so stay tuned there, but we have some middleware. Um, that we're kind of working on to actually provide those services, both formal verification as well as uh, kind of vetted smart contracts in a library type form. I promise I didn't tee that up on purpose. That yeah, was just yeah. a cool idea. <laughs> All right. So, and, and this was, I had thrown a slide in here to talk about the Genesis block. We've kind of hit that over the head, but I just wanted to kind of come back and just touch base on that. From a Genesis perspective, again, it's the root of the blockchain. When you spin new nodes up, you always have to use that same Genesis block. As you spin a new node up, it has to have that same Genesis and block. Then it will, it build. And it will download the entire chain That's and, correct. and do all of its math goo to make sure that nothing has been corrupted or changed or malformed. And so uh, if you've played with creating your own nodes, uh, like if you were to download Bitcoin, uh, it can take several hours to several days uh, to get from Genesis all the way up to the current state. Yeah, and that's a good point, Derek. I mean, this, this question comes up a lot where people say, well, this sounds great if I have a big computer, a really fast computer. Like Derek mentioned, I mean, it could take days, hours, days. What happens if it's my phone? Or a Raspberry Pi or, yeah. yeah, something smaller. So the key concept to remember there is around clients. They have this concept of what's called a light client and a full client. So when you're talking about a full client, you're talking about what Derek was mentioning earlier where we download the entire history, and that's really safe, right? Because Derek goes and downloads every block that's ever been in the blockchain. Like if you go fire up uh, any of the public like MIS or any of those for Ethereum, when you fire that thing up, it it'll literally pull down everything there, that's ever yeah. happened in Ethereum history. And so people say, oh my God, that's so much data. Right, you know, yeah, everything. it takes forever. How can I use that? How can I use that on a phone? Well, the idea is, remember, there's a Merkle tree behind this. There's a hash tree, essentially, behind all this. You could basically prune that tree, right? So you could say, take a whole segment of that tree and hash that. And then say, from now on, I just refer to this hash. Right. And that will make sure I don't have to pull down all those blocks. Start from yesterday's block and go forward. Exactly. Okay. Because the volatility here really happens in the, the blocks that are just getting minted. The, the first, the right at the head of the blockchain, the first two or three blocks until the consensus is built, that's where the volatility is. You shouldn't have blocks back at the start of the block changing. If you do, you got a big problem. Big problem. And, yeah. and that also speaks to um, how, uh, when you're developing your application, when do you determine that that state is official? And we talk about, you know, the volatility in the first couple of blocks, but uh, right now it's kind of, you know, at 12 confirmations uh, or 12 other nodes saying, yep, that's correct, that's when we say you're good to go. Yeah, and that's where the concept that Derek mentioned earlier about soft forks. So we have this concept of what's called forks, which essentially you can imagine all these nodes are running the transactions, right? So as the nodes are running them, they're in various states, right? Like Derek's little tree over there of his nodes, maybe they're like all of a sudden they start forking. And when I say forking, they're coming off the main branch. So they had, we were all in sync. And then Derek started processing transactions and I started tra processing transactions. At some point we should come together Cut, because right. we should match. Right. If we don't, that's when we have that's like bad. a hard fork. Yeah. That, that's bad. So um, there's, the soft forks will happen all the time, and they should eventually collide back, and it shouldn't be too far back. That's what I'm saying, like two or three right. blocks. Okay. What other things about the, the general mining do we need to, to know about? Yeah, the other thing I would mention there is the preloaded accounts that we talked about, mm -hmm. um, just making sure those things get loaded up there when you're starting up your Genesis block. Okay. But if we move on to some of the off-chain, I wanted to hit on a couple, couple things here about off-chain, because we had been talking about this a little bit around storage. All right. But I want to kind of drive that concept home because this is a really key consideration when you start building decentralized applications, and it really fits in DevOps because this is other infrastructure you got to manage. That you got to manage. Yeah. And yeah, from an IT, uh, IT ops perspective, you got the developers writing their code, 
and taking into consideration on-chain versus off-chain, the IT infrastructure guys, which those guys are close to my heart, they have to maintain, whether it be a DocDB or a SQL database or a Mongo or, or MySQL or whatever. So additional infrastructure is now coming into play beyond just the nodes that you might have in your private blockchain consortium. Yeah. So just to kind of talk about what, what are some of these off-chain components that we're talking, uh, the first one would be an oracle. Um, and, and this term oracle is used in the Ethereum space, and I have a diagram here to kind of show it. And essentially, we mentioned before, the blockchain can't make calls off, right? So it can't call off-chain into a web service or anything. Let's take a typical model where maybe we do need to get some external data. It's a trading application. And we need to get some external data to feed into our smart contract. So the smart contract is going to do all its work and, as normal. Uh, it'll be all transaction-based. We have all the history. Everything's great there. But we need some external data at, let's say, a scheduled interval, maybe okay. every day. So what we do in that case is we have what's called an Oracle service that sits off chain. Now this thing essentially is just another client that's calling into the blockchain. So he's just going to call into the smart contract and make transactions. He might update the state. So we're storing the state of whatever this, uh, this rate is that's mm -hmm. being updated in the external world. So we could store that as state in the smart contract and have the Oracle just call in there periodically and update that thing. Well, the downside to that obviously is we got to trust that Oracle. Um, what happens if somebody hacks the Oracle and starts injecting bad rates into our system? Mm -hmm. um, the smart contract's not going to know. He's just going to take the rate at, at face value and use it. So you're saying that I can't call a web service like the Bing APIs to get a stock price, but you are saying that I can have this Oracle. What's the difference between calling off to a web service as opposed to calling off to an Oracle? You're not calling off. Okay, so that's the key thing. We're, we never have the blockchain call off. We're actually going backwards. We're going back in. So we have a scheduling mechanism that's running on the outside here that says every day at 2 p.m., call this smart contract and update this state with whatever this value is. And we can put logic out there to do okay. whatever we need to there. right? So it works really well. And there's services actually built around this. Oracleize is one of the big ones out there, the partners. And they have a whole system that basically allows it to look like it's actually calling off-chain, but actually what it's doing is making callbacks into the blockchain. But at the end of the day, an Oracle is still just a node on the network and it's talking to the chain itself. Yep. Uh, it's not going a, a web, it's not using SOAP, it's not doing all of those things that I wanted to do yep. uh, previously. Okay. One thing to consider from a DevOps, to pull this back into the DevOps space, because we're talking a little Debbie here, but like from a DevOps sense, what do they need to consider? Well, we got now this external service that's going to make calls into there. Well, that thing's going to have key pairs, obviously, sure. right? Because in order to do a transaction, it has to have a key pair. That key pair can actually be in the smart contract. So okay. we can set up functions that basically, like a getter and a setter, let's say. Let's say a setter, just for our use case that we were talking about before. If we can inject values into a smart contract, we wouldn't just write directly to the state. We call a set function. Okay. In that set function, we can actually put a function modifier. It's called in Solidity. And actually say, this can only be called by this Oracle. Oh, okay. So, so that way we can kind of lock it down, down a little yeah. bit. Okay. And, and the DevOps guys kind of have to be you know, obviously in sync with this because if they change something out there in an external service, the keys don't match, broken. Right, you know, okay. Broken. So that's an Oracle. You got anything else? Yeah, from a sense of like looking beyond Oracles, this is where Microsoft has been focused a lot of effort. And if you look out on our GitHub, uh, Marley Gray has been working a lot on this technology called Cripplets. And if you think about Cripplets, there's a lot of different things that these Cripplets can do, but this is really an innovation point that we're trying to bring some of our kind of expertise in this space um, to, to fill this void. So we looked at one particular use case of the Oracles to okay. say, how could we make that situation better? Well, what's the issue that you have around that right now? The issue you have is that we don't 100% trust that Oracle. Okay. We could have somebody hack that Oracle. We could have other things happen to that Oracle. We don't, we don't necessarily like that. How could we make that thing much stronger? Okay. And so if we looked at what uh, Intel was working on with the SGX stuff, um, so the secure code execution stuff that they have built there. This is a hardware thing. Correct. This is a hardware module. And we said, could we build some strong relationship between that piece of hardware and our blockchain in order in such a way that we can anchor these ITSS hosts on the blockchain. So now we know for sure. It's trusted. It's trusted, basically. And now we have a trusted environment that allows us to do things. So Oracle would obviously be a great use case for this, right? Because now we can trust our Oracle 100%. But you can think that this could go beyond. Okay, great. And so what other types of, of patterns do we need to consider here uh, beyond Oracles and Cripplets? Uh, what other things do we need to consider? Yeah, I'd say the other big one that we talked about before was storage. Um, so being able to do off-chain storage on here, there's a variety of different models that you can use there. 
There's things like IPFS, Interplanetary File System, Swarm. There's a bunch of different off-chain vendors that are spinning up around this space to be able to do that. We also have first-party components, as Derek mentioned, DocDB, mm -hmm. and we're looking to say, we could use those. And when you think about how, how do you effectively use those and trust it, it's two different models. You gotta think about verification and security. So it's two different things, right? So if we can say, hey, we could take we could take an external data source, it doesn't matter what it is right now to store data. It could be a SQL database even. Mm -hmm. That thing can store data for us. It does a good job. We've been using it for 30 plus years. Right. So if we use that to actually store our data and sign it, or hash that actually, right. And, and inject that back into the blockchain, we can 100% verify if anybody changes that record set that we Makes have sense. out there. Yep. So we haven't provided any security with that model, we've just been able to verify it. Right. If somebody wants to go tamper with the data, there's nothing to stop them from doing that. They could go in that SQL database and tamper it, but it won't match up to what's on the blockchain. We can point back to that point in time and say this is when it This changed. is when it happened. Now, if you, take that, love that. if you take that a step further and say, well, we want to do that plus we want security, we can encrypt it. Right. So we still have our key pairs, so we can use some encryption there to actually do the encryption, and then we can work with certain parties to expose selectively that data. Very cool. Very cool. Well, that wraps it up for this module. Uh, we're going to come back here in uh, the next little bit and talk about the development of the decentralized apps, so stay tuned. Welcome back to the MVA, and we're going to be drawing some architecture here on DevOps. Yes. I just wanted to introduce ourselves. I'm Windowser, and this is the Book of Doodle. That's me. I am the Book of Doodle. So Derek, uh, DevOps, we yeah. talked a little bit about it. Yep. Maybe we can draw out some scenarios here around uh, some of the interesting I'm things gonna that we I'm going to use the do. pen. All right. All right, so DevOps is really, really cool. In the, uh, a previous module, we talked about how you may have your DAP developers working one stream, the front-end interface, it could be the UX designers. We also talked about how the folks writing the smart contracts will be, uh, could be a different team. But what does that ultimately look like uh, insofar as a DevOps process? So here I go to the whiteboard. Over here on the left-hand side, get out of the way, Kale. Over here on the left-hand side, I've got two different streams here, and I'm going to use UX slash DAP, and that could be ASP.NET, MVC, JavaScript, Swift, whatever it is that you want. Uh, and in, then here, uh, you might have the, uh, the smart contract folks. Now, they're going to be working in their own threads, maybe even in their own language, and as we go along here, uh, these guys will check their code into GitHub, or any other repository that you want. Uh, GitHub could be happening here as well. And along the way, the developer of the UX and the DAP, they're going to be using traditional tools uh, that you would be familiar with right now, whether it be uh, uh, Photoshop or Visual Studio, whatever. The smart contract developers, again, we talked about all the different frameworks and tools that you might have available to us. Uh, these guys are going to be set up a little bit differently. Kale, give me a couple of, of examples here of some things that we might have on the local person's PC. Yeah, I mean, we talked about a couple of them earlier there. One could be even a, the online Solidity compiler. They could okay. just be writing directly in their browser. They could be using something like the EtherCAM product of Ethereum Studio, which is kind of a self-contained IDE and, and kind of deployment it actually encompasses some of the DevOps in a box. So this one, the Solidity compiler is, is open source? That's correct. Okay. And what, what was his name again? You can call that Cosmos. Cosmos, That's the one that's yep. up there, the online Solidity compiler. Uh -huh. And then Ethercamp, Ethercamp is Ethercamp. Ethereum, Ethercamp. Ethereum Studio is their product okay. that they have out there. And that's a closed source. That's a product that it's a, a kit that you can buy and, and develop on? Yeah, it's a single VM image inside Azure. You can just go up and spin up an instance. Oh, from the it. marketplace. Yeah, and you got an endpoint, you can just bounce against it, and you're off to the races. Again, through your browser. Right. So once it stands up, you just go to that private endpoint, you're good to go. But if I were a developer on a, a traditional, you know, I've got my Surface Book, uh, it's got Visual Studio in it, mm -hmm. I want to do some, some uh, on-device modeling of my smart contract, I might have something like Test RPC. Mm -hmm. I might have Truffle installed. I might have v VS Code mm -hmm. or Visual Studio. I like VS Code because there's a very cool uh, integration uh, pack uh, that works with the Solidity, Solidity language. Uh, so you can get some great text highlighting. You can get, um, the, Truffle's going to take care of uh, setting up my framework uh, and kind of scaffolding it out. Uh, what other things are going on I, on here? Yeah, I think the difference, if you draw a contrast between what VS Code is and what something like Visual Studio brings to the table, mm -hmm. so full VS, Visual Studio, 
a lot more visual elements, but obviously right. they can do things like the deployment much easier, where VS Code's more modular based. You're mm -hmm. going to pull a package in to do the deployment, whether it's Dapple or Truffle or something like this, you can actually pull those in and start using them to do it. Yeah, so these are different frameworks that allow you to kind of orchestrate the functionality of doing that. So you're basically doing this as the code editor, mm -hmm. and it's helping you write code and make sure that it's compiled and everything. And this is handling more of the DevOps of deployment side. Right. And when I was getting started on this, I had uh, test RPC up and going. It was helpful. I, I opened this up in Chrome, um, but there were some other things that I needed going on down here. Um, I was able to do a lot of it in PowerShell, uh, but uh, dropping down into the command line, uh, you're going to need to do some of those things. Uh, what other types of kit would you need on uh, a smart contract developer's uh, box? Is this well, really I mean, about another, it? Another big one, so this is really focused around core Ethereum that like mm -hmm. we mentioned earlier. We also have Strato, remember, with block that's right. So one of the cool things that those guys have done is actually stood up a dev box that's running in the public space. So it's called Strato Dev 4 right now. So if you just go Strato dash Dev 4, mm -hmm. um, if you go out there to that endpoint, .blockapps.net, um, there's actually a Strato instance running there that you can just use freely. Okay. So if you just wanted to start bouncing code around and see how you can upload contracts, you can play with it, see how it works. Obviously, it's in the public space. So if you're concerned about your IP and things like that, you want to keep it safe, then you would spin up your own instance of Strato. Okay. So okay. once I have my code, that's going to take place. And again, I'm, I'm focusing on the smart contract guy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have some .sol files. Yep. I'm going to have, what other kind of files am I going to have? Well, this is primarily going to be your smart contract output, right? You're going to have some .sol files. You're probably going to have some this accounts. This is bytecode. Yeah. Okay, so this is the bytecode that uh, would get ultimately copied and pasted into, uh, like, MIST or wherever. And Correct. We'll, we'll get into that here in a second. I mean, obviously, we've created some accounts and things that we're using here, but right. you shouldn't have any hard references to that. It's something to keep an eye out for. Don't be hard coding those things in here, because as we move through our different, maybe like a staging environment or a dev environment into mm -hmm. a production environment, we don't want to have those dependencies. It's going to cause breakage later. Okay. So, uh, any other type of files that the the, sort, the the smart contract guy, ultimately he's going to end up with a dot .sol, Correct. what else has he got? This is really his primary output, right. and the DAP guy is going to have a lot more stuff, right? He's going to have, what chain am I talking to? Am I talking to test RPC? Am I talking to Strato? Am I talking to public Ethereum? Whatever. Mm -hmm. So, he's going to have all the configuration for that kind of thing. And again, that stuff should be in configuration files. Mm -hmm. So, as you're, you're putting that through, this way you can move between environments easily. Okay. And so, uh, from a DevOps perspective, and this would be very familiar to uh, organizations that are just, you know, deploying to Azure, like Azure Web Apps, you might have config files that specify dev, test, stage, prod, uh, and these are reporting out to uh, the different block networks, blockchain networks that you might be uh, uh, working with. One of the cool things you can do too, um, and we're talking about DevOps, is this is kind of like your primary output that Derek's talking about here, but we also have to orchestrate maybe testing. So Truffle mm -hmm. has a really good test framework inside of it that allows you to write unit tests essentially for okay. your chain. So you can use those, and one of the neat things is some of the guys in our teams are starting to write uh, Visual Studio uh, Team Services extensions. Okay. Right, so you can write these yourself. Um, you can go up to the site and build these. They're relatively easy to build. Mm -hmm. um, you can use some of the out-of-the-box stuff that we have up there. You can build a custom agent if you would like. But essentially what you're doing is building up a, a framework over here so it can execute your, your Truffle test okay. as part of your, your build and deployment. So I'm going to change up my scenario here. I'm going to put this in VSTS uh, as opposed to GitHub. And the reason I'm going to do that is I'm going to kind of extend on what we've been talking about here. So our developers are using VSTS or GitHub. But uh, because we've got this uh, framework out here that we can work with, we'll just kind of go from there. So uh, you've got your developers, and the process is going to look very familiar to what you would be expecting in any other application. You've got your developers. They are going to check into source control. Inside your source control, uh, you may have unit tests, you may have all of the other things that you would have as part of your DAP. So you would have uh, user stories, you may have user experience, uh, the original uh, imagery files, all of the things that create your application holistically. Off-chain storage as well. Yep. So down here, uh, you may also have uh, release management mm -hmm. that helps coordinate all of this stuff to go from dev to test which runs your unit tests, which uh, cycles your off-chain storage, which resets your blockchain. Mm 
And then if all of those tests pass, then you move on to uh, a different environment. Uh, for, for the sake of argument, let's say that our test environment all happened in memory. So you could write that from a build agent. Uh, you could write that just in a VM that gets deployed. You run your stuff, you test it, and then you just throw it away. Then your integration testing might be a, uh, a non-prod blockchain that uh, you would have. So from there, and let's uh, kind of start a new, a new board here. Uh, you've got, just thinking from an infrastructural perspective, here's Azure. You've got your developers on one end. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about was dev test labs. So you can set up uh, individualized images for each developer to have their own uh, development experience uh, so that it doesn't all have to be on their own VM. One of the key things that this empowers is because the tooling is changing so fast and so rapidly, keeping everyone up to snuff on the same versions and they're iterating constantly off of GitHub, keeping those frameworks up to date becomes very important. So they may be using dev test labs. Then the infrastructure guys uh, for test may be just one or two VMs that are small enough where everything runs in memory. Then you've got INT or UAT. These may be actual non-prod blockchains. So if you were to spin up a consortium network uh, within Azure, you might be talking about, say, like a, a five-node blockchain environment. And that helps to then make sure that all of your uh, uh, asynchronicity is doing well. Mm -hmm. And then, excuse me, finally, you get through your release management pipeline, then you get to prod, which could be a much bigger environment. And the release manager uh, environment, it may be helping to control uh, what goes out to the public blockchain or to the public uh, consortium member. Uh, but it also is a great place where the security layer can come into play. You would have, for instance, uh, different key vault policies here than you would have here. Maybe no key vault here uh, because it was just in memory. And so, as you can see, it looks very similar to what a DevOps workflow would look like from a traditional application development standpoint. But there are some things that you want to take into consideration as you're developing these two different major threads, again, the UX versus the smart contract. And that's no different than you would have different tiers of, of things happening uh, in a, a traditional uh, application development uh, experience. This could be the mobile guy and this could be the web guy. Um, but it's important to note that Azure is going to provide you with a lot of great tooling. Uh, Dev Test Labs, if you've not seen that, definitely check that out because it allows you to templatize what the end user developer uh, is going to be needing and keep all of the frameworks and tooling up to date. Yeah, I think Azure is the perfect fit for this kind of thing because it's very easy to spin these things up very easy, the mm -hmm. infrastructure behind the scenes. So we templatize them, make them very easy to spin up, and then it just becomes a switch to turn them on and off, whatever we need. Uh, and then production, obviously, is a much more vetted Yeah, it was a great system. use case story about that because uh, I spun up one. It was like a 50-node cluster just to see what I could do with it. Uh, and it was in multiple different regions, and I spun it up, and it worked great. Then I started powering down different regions to see how I could in inject forks and soft forks so that I could tell how is my code going to behave in the real world. Azure makes that incredibly, incredibly easy to do. So there you go. Welcome back to our MVA, where we're talking about blockchain on this module. Kale is going to introduce us to a quick little walkthrough of how Truffle works. So we'll turn it over to Kale. Sure. And when you get started with Truffle, um, we have a couple of different vectors. Uh, it used to be you had to kind of go out and look at the docs and kind of figure out what to set up. Uh, the demos that are out there on the read the docs for Truffle actually reference using test RPC. Um, and if you've been through that, there's a bunch of different steps you need to do there, but uh, we try to kind of streamline that a bit um, with Azure. So if you take a look over here in the portal, um, it's actually in the portal now, so in the marketplace. So if you click on that little plus sign, let me zoom in there a little bit so you can see that. Um, this little plus sign up here in the corner to create a new asset inside Azure. And basically in here, we're just going to search for the word truffle. So if we search for truffle up here, um, we'll actually see it come up in the search results here. We can click on that. And you can actually see over here that it actually describes kind of 
you know, what the product does, as well as, you know, what happens after you get this thing running. It's actually going to generate 10 accounts, so it's going to have a test RPC on it already pre-installed for us. It's going to have Truffle and all the dependencies already installed. So we're off to the races. We can start developing in a couple minutes after this thing deploys. Yeah, and that's a great example of how you can leverage the Azure infrastructure to really bootstrap your developers. You don't have to worry about getting everything set up on your local PC. Uh, you can also use that uh, same marketplace image from Truffle uh, and put that into dev test labs uh, so that you can spin those up, spin those down. Uh, so great use case for that. So let's keep going. Yeah, and in here, just to kind of demonstrate what we're talking about from a one-click perspective inside Azure, when we go into the portal, I'll go ahead and zoom in here again, we basically just have these steps over here that we need to roll through. And each one of these, we're just going to have to answer a bunch of questions about what do we want to name this thing, and do we want it, what kind of disk type do we need? Do we want high performance, or are we okay with something that's maybe a little bit slower and it's cheaper? What are some of the general guidelines around um, this type of uh, environment? I mean, Truffle has very little overhead, so you can run these on slow machines. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend putting them on A0s. I mean, okay. I barely recommend if anybody put anything on A0 mm -hmm. unless you're just testing something really quick. Um, my, my general rule of thumb is to go with like a D2. Okay. Um, that's just a standard win um, to use these things. It is a good note that you talked about dev test labs. One thing we should be doing is making sure that we shut these down at night, especially if it's for Absolutely. a developer, because we're wasting money yeah. you know, having the thing run. Absolutely, and the, the new timer features are available to all virtual machines running in Azure. So you have the ability, not just in dev test labs, but in any virtual machine to auto shut those things down at night. Great point. Yeah, so I'm not going to get through this. You could fill this out yourself. I actually pre-provisioned one so that we could uh, get through our demo a little quicker here. And so on my desktop now, in, inside Azure, I actually have a Truffle image running here. You can see it right here. Um, this is running Ubuntu 16.04. And um, it's got everything installed. So if I pop up and I have an SSH console here directly in this box, I already logged in. And simply, if I just want to start running a demo with uh, Truffle, I can just start up test RPC. Now, what's happening behind the scenes here, as we mentioned earlier, is if you look at, I have the font exposed here so you can see it a little bit bigger. But basically, we have 10 accounts here that it got created automatically for us. We talked about the Genesis block. You can think of that like this one. So this is running in memory but it actually just generated 10 accounts for us automatically. And did it populate it with uh, with Ether and everything? Yeah, the first one has some Ether in it, but the other ones don't. Okay. And that's what we'll kind of demo in this uh, deck, just to kind of show that you can transfer Ether from one to one another. Remember that and are they already them. unlocked, or do we have to go through the whole process of unlocking them and everything? Yeah, and test RPCs are unlocked, okay. um, because it doesn't function the same as right. pure Ethereum. But yeah, you could run the same demo pointed at Ethereum, but obviously you'd have to unlock the accounts if you want to start moving, okay. you know, doing transactions with them. Great. Um, so basically, we have to leave this run. So if you look at the bottom of this thing, it actually shows you these are the mnemonics that it used to create that. This is like a recovery key, um, for, as we mentioned before. So these are using the Ethereum wallet in order to build those. And you can see it's listening on 8545 right now. So if we come over to Truffle, um, and I'm just bringing up another SSH into the same box, and all I need to do to start working with this is I just make a directory, and we'll just call this the MVA demo. And then we'll go into that directory and then we'll run Truffle init. Very much like anything in uh, Node.js, um, we do a lot of init. Uh, Truffle's built heavily on Node, um, so you see a lot of... Creates a scaffolding for us. Of. Yeah, so if we take a look out here what actually got created, we actually created an app folder. That's where our app code's gonna go for our test application here, just scaffolded out a simple uh, HTML and JavaScript application for us. Uh, the contracts are where the smart contracts are. Uh, the migrations has the scripts that enable us to do the auto-migration features that Truffle has for DevOps. The test is the unit test for these contracts. And then Truffle.js is kind of important. This is the um, main configuration for Truffle. So if we take a look at that real quick. Kind of describes the application as a whole. Yeah, you can see that um, when it does a build, which is the entry point for the application, the index, it also has where the CSS and the AppJS and the images folder. So just describing the application. And then from an RPC perspective, this is where it's going to talk to a blockchain. So okay. you can think of this as JSON RPC. So right now it's pointed to local hosts. And actually, if you're running this in Azure, you don't want that. So what you want is to be able to put your endpoint in here, um, whatever the name of your or the IP address of your machine is. So how do you find that? You come back over to the Azure portal, click on your machine that you spun up, and it's right here. Um, you can get your public IP and you can get a DNS name if you have one set up for it. So I'm just going to grab the public IP here. We don't have any dependency on naming here. We've got this cool little thing in here where you can just hover over it and grab it quickly. 
pop that guy in there. So now we're we're pointing to ourselves because if we pointed to um, you know local host and this thing's running in Azure, obviously it can't resolve. So it's not going to know what to do with it. So once we have that all fixed up, now we can actually get started with our, our truffle. Now let's take a look at the contracts. You can see there's um, a few of them in here. So we have this convert lib, we have Metacoin, and we have this migrations. The migrations, and you can look at these in your leisure, but the migrations is basically a contract to keep track of when we're doing migrations, which addresses point to which smart contract. Just allows us to do that DevOps type operation to be mm -hmm. able to detect when one changes, which ones we need to deploy. Okay. Dependency graph kind of. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Metacoin is, is the core of what we're building here. So we're going to build this token system, and that's what you're going to see here demonstrated in a second, and convert lib has a dependency on that. Okay. So we're going to see that actually play out. So if we just did uh, a truffle compile, it's going to basically look for any soul files um, and compile them for us. So this is going to use the standard soul C compiler. It's going to go out and compile them. Now, one thing to keep in mind is it doesn't matter what order they are when they're being compiled because it's not going to go try to execute anything, right? So it's just going to strictly do a static compile to make sure these things are actually syntactically correct. Okay. So you're not looking at logical errors. You're just compiling it into bytecode, and then you're done. Correct. So we do that, and we actually have those out there. Now, the interesting thing is when you start to get into the migrate. So if we did a uh, truffle migrate right now, what's going to happen is it's going to look and see what we've deployed so far. It's going to see these three smart contracts that aren't deployed to this test RPC, our blockchain, mm -hmm. and it's going to go ahead and deploy them for us. Okay, so even the first deployment can be used as a migration. That's correct. Okay. So if we do a truffle migrate here, what we should see is it detects some things. Now, I'm going to, I don't need to zoom in here, but I just wanted to show point out a couple things. You can see that it's calling the migration, so it's deploying the migrations contract, because that's what's going to keep track of our state, of basically what's deployed, what's not deployed. And then it's going to go ahead and detect the convert lib needs to be deployed first, and you can see this linking command right here. So this is, there's not an actual linker there, but it's basically establishing that, because when we establish the convert lib up there, which Metacoin has a dependency on, mm -hmm. Uh, it's going to make sure that I laid con convert lib down, get the address for that, inject it into Metacoin, and then deploy Metacoin. Okay, so it helps build the dependency tree. That's correct. So now we have all those deployed out there, and if we popped over to our our little console over here, where we remember we started up our test RPC, we see we got some action over here. We see some transactions actually came through. We can see the block times that are on those, and again, this is an emulation, but it's actually simulating exactly. There's the gas usage. There's the block number. This is block number two. Gives you time and date stamps, tells you everything that's happening over there. So we actually deployed a contract. You can see here, contract created. See the address of where these things got created. So really cool to get started when you start building up these applications and not a lot of fuss. You know, you didn't see me building any kind of blockchain here. Right. I'm just getting this thing running so that I can actually develop something. Now after that, we would basically just do a, uh, a truffle build. And by default, while that's doing the build, it's, it's building the application up. I'm going to pop back over here and show you a couple things about Azure that um, are pertinent to uh, these blockchains that you might want to be aware of. So one of the things is, um, in this case, we did that test RPC, remember, and how do we get those things exposed? So as I'm clicking through here, I'm just showing you, basically, if you go into your virtual machine, and go into your network interface, let me zoom in there a little bit. So you would go into this network, whoops, you go into this network interface section, which is basically the NIC for your VM. You would click on that NIC, which is up here. And then you would click on this network security group over here, which is essentially a way for you to expose ports, right? So you're going to be exposing the ports to that uh, test RPC instance that's running right now. That's correct. So we have this here, and there's also, I'm going to show you another one that we're going to expose because we're going to need it here in a second, uh, the actual application, the DAP itself. Okay. So over here, if you take a look, when you use this image, and this one's built in the marketplace, so it's already set up for you, you can see in here that we basically have all the ports open that we need. So here's our inbound security rules. You can see we have SSH, which is how we're kind of managing the box, and we're logging into it. We have Truffle Web, which is port 8080, which is what our DAP's going to run on. And then we have Test RPC, which is 8545, and that's the one for our RPC connection to the, simulate the blockchain. Okay, so that, that, that's our blockchain emulator. That's correct. Okay. So in the future, when you start deploying these things out, um, these things will make more sense, but you just keep in mind that you do have uh, functionality there in Azure to expose those things either externally or even internally. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't want to expose it to public internet and you want to attach to by a site-to-site -site connection or something like that into Azure and do your testing that way. Okay. So once we have our Truffle build done, 
Um, basically, the last step we would do is do a Truffle serve, which has a little web server built in here, to actually run our application for us so we can see it actually functioning. So you can see that we went ahead and served our app out. You can see it's listening on 8080, again, because that's the one we exposed. That's our DAP. And, uh, you know, everything completed without any errors. So what we should be able to do is pop up into here, and let's take a look at it. And we need to get the IP address again. While he's doing that, it's important to remember that uh, you've got several different steps uh, just to do that truffle. You've got a, a truffle uh, compile, you've got a truffle uh, migrate, truffle build, and then truffle run uh, is actually what spins up the DAP itself. Uh, that's going to be the UX or the front end that gets built along your command line chain. Uh, on the other side, that test RPC, that's simulating your uh, endpoint. So you both have a web server and a uh, uh, an Ethereum network endpoint uh, out there in your environment. Right. And so then when we spin up our application, we can see up here we would have a send to and we would have a, an address that we could actually send these to. So we could use uh, kind of our test RPC that we had running over here before and we could actually send data over to there. Now one thing I wanted to show you is when you start using this thing, um, you'll actually see, I guess I'm logged in, I'm not seeing any ether right now. We might take a breakpoint here right now. Just one second, because I don't know what's going on here. I should see 10,000. Yeah, you have meta. Okay, so we're back over here, and you can see now that when we start the application up and we go to port 8080, let me zoom in there and show you that we're just going to the IP address of what's provisioned up there in Azure, and we're going to port 8080 for our DAP. Um, we actually see that we have uh, 10,000 meta coins here now, yes. which is a token right. system, basically. Lots of money. Here. Yeah. So um, what this is doing behind the scenes, and I'll show you the code here in a second, is it's actually just reading what accounts exist on this blockchain, our test RPC, and which... Um, so we're reading count zero, basically. Remember, we had 10 accounts. Mm -hmm. So we're reading the first account that's in there that got minted with this MetaCoin. Right. Now, if we went and looked at any of the other ones, they don't have any Meta right now, and I'll show you that in a second, too. But what we want to do is basically give them some. Let's so give them we, some Meta. Yeah, we want to give some of those. So let's say we're going to give 10 Meta to one of the other accounts. Okay. Now, how do we know the accounts? We've got to come back over here and look at our test RPC, and we'll just grab one. So let's grab the second guy, this guy. We just grab his address, we bring it over here, pop it in. What we should see in a second here, and you see it, uh, let me see if I can zoom in so you, maybe you can see it better, is you can see that our meta dropped because we actually executed our smart contract. Mm -hmm. And you see it was instant because basically we're running yeah, a test RPC. Test RPC, one node, nothing to synchronize. Cool. Yeah, so what happened was we, we took those 10 meta, we transferred it to a different account. Now, how do we see that that actually succeeded? We actually saw the the debit happened here, mm -hmm. right? Now let's see it on the other side. Yeah, correct. Let's see the other side. So how do we do that? Well, let's pop into our Truffle node here again. Remember, it was running our web server. And I can tell you that it's in the uh, app itself. And if you look in the JavaScript folder, and this is just a simple example, but it's something that you can use to start working off of. Um, if you pop open the app.js, which is kind of the core code, whoops. It's kind of the core functionality for the application. And if you scroll down to the bottom of this, it's just a bunch of JavaScript code. And it's using Web3.js to actually talk to it. And you can see down here, when the app starts up, it's just going to go read account zero. Okay. And that's what it's going to display on the screen. So instead of reading account zero, let's display account one, which is the second account actually in the system. So we'll just pop that open with VI, change that. Go back over here and run our truffle. Migrate. We don't have to migrate anything. No. Remember, we didn't change any smart contracts. So oh, you just changed the JavaScript. Correct. And then our just, DAP. Or your DAP. So you just relaunch that uh, truffle uh, web, uh, web server. 
Correct. And it should have 10. And there you go. Awesome. So if you look at the screen now, you can see we're logged into the second account and we actually have 10 meta. So proving that it actually functioned and actually transferred the value the correct way. This is a very simple example, but it's just showing you some of the power of what happens with Truffle. We could actually walk through and change things in the smart contract and you can actually see it go through, but I recommend you guys check it out and take a look at it. It's very easy to get started with. That sounds great. So thanks for watching our little demo. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Welcome back to the MBA on Microsoft Blockchain as a Service. We're going to wrap up with uh, Module 5 here on the development of decentralized applications. So we're going to get into my favorite area where we actually get into some code and actually uh, working on some things here now. Yay, code. Something. Yes, less theory, more code. So again, uh, and, and not to beat this over the head, but I'm going to show this slide again one more time. Uh, we talked about this uh, in a previous one, but basically what I want to talk about here is Understanding a development, uh, a developer's, a day in the life of a developer of a decentralized right. app. Okay. So when he comes in to actually build an app, there's nothing special about the actual application itself. It's just right? code. It's just code, right? So it could be a web application, it could be a client application, right. uh, like a fat client. It could be anything that we built our application platforms on to begin with. It could even be a, a UWP application, you know, in Windows. Mm -hmm. So we can think about, from that perspective, it's just an application. Once we start talking about the back end and where we want to actually concentrate, and we talked about a lot of concepts about, you know, thinking about storage and what we need to store in the blockchain versus what we want to keep off chain. Uh, once we kind of figure out, okay, these are the core Got things. The architecture. That are important. Yeah, yep. the architecture around what's important, what do we really need to store on the blockchain, that we need that immutability, that we need that shared aspect of it, and mm -hmm. those kind of pieces. Once we, we determine what that is, then we can sit down and start building that. I actually see this functioning as like two different developers, but it could be one. And I've actually seen this play out in actual hackathons in the real life that we would sit down to build a DAP. Well, somebody has to build the actual smart contract and then somebody has to build the DAP. And there's a lot of work to do on both sides. So we basically divide and conquer and we would have a group of people just building the, the smart contract. And they would exercise it through debugging tools. We'll talk about some of those. And then the developers over here working on the actual front end. Okay. Okay. So in this instance, you separated what we were pre previously talking about, DAP, as the whole thing. Yep. You're separating out that it could be an ASP.NET, MVC, a UWP app that those guys are working on. And then behind the scenes working on, and, and I call it the middle tier, but it's not necessarily the middle tier. It could also be the third tier. Yep. Um, those guys are the ones that are writing the smart contracts. And there's specialized tooling that is available uh, that uh, you're going to talk about, hopefully. Yeah, and it's important to keep in mind that these tools can work together, right? So it's not that everybody has to use the same tool, right? So the people writing the smart contracts could be using Ethereum Studio, and the people who are writing the front end could be using Strato Block Apps. I mean, these things work together, basically, because the smart contract is portable code. Okay, the so the smart, file. The, yeah. the sole file, that solidity, that is the common denominator across all of this stuff. That's correct. The only thing you have to keep in mind there is public versus private. There is some you know, differences between those, but there still is carryover, right? We could develop something and then test it and put it up in testnet, make sure that everything works and put it in the public network. Okay. Or we could develop it just for private network, whatnot. So. But it's also important to remember that the code that you write, again, back, going back to module one, is the epitome of open source, is you put it out on the public net, anybody can decompile it and look at what you've done. Correct. Okay. And in a private sense, obviously, there's some shared trust there. Sure. So I'm working with Eric in a B2B scenario. Yeah, he can see my code, but we've already kind of negotiated on it. So in that case, maybe it's okay. okay. Uh, because we're not sharing it with the world. I'm just sharing it with my business partner. So what kind of frameworks do we have to help kickstart this stuff? Yeah, so I look at this as like a, there's basically three different kind of buckets that I'll fit these things into when you start working for this as a developer. The first one being the frameworks. So we mentioned some of these as, as in passing here, but Truffle being a good one for a dev platform. Uh, Ethereum is one that basically takes, um, and I'll, I'll pull back here a second, the, the primary one for working with Ethereum blockchains is Web3. Okay. So Web3.js, there's also a Web3.j for Java. Um, these are kind of the industry standard for interfacing with blockchain. Okay. Um, and when you're talking about just pure Ethereum, like uh, just talk about it from that. But sense. I want to write .NET. What capabilities or, or tools do you have available for me to write my C-sharp code. Correct. So, an Ethereum is what's filling that gap, okay. right? So, an Ethereum okay. came along and built, basically, a, an interface to allow you to use, write C-sharp code and do functions that Web3 would be doing. Now, is it a native port or is it just a projection? Uh, it's a native port. Okay. So, they actually built a thing. Okay, yeah. cool. 
Um, so block apps is a is a totally different framework. We're going to talk about that in some of our demonstrations. But the the block apps is a is a kind of a totally different mindset. So when we we've been talking about blockchains with Bitcoin and Ethereum and these things and private Ethereum, block apps actually took the concept and said when you're working with one of these blockchains, I mentioned Web three. It's it's called JSON RPC that you're actually going to be the protocol that you're using to communicate with the chain. Right. And I don't think you know just off the top of my head from enterprise sense. Not a lot of people are writing JSON RPC code if they're not yeah, working. That's pretty with old school. Yeah. Yes. So in that sense, it's a new protocol. So developers have to kind of get up to speed with it. There's a lot of kind of boilerplate code you have to right. write to kind of get these things running. Just a bootstrap. Yeah. And when you look at what Block Apps and what their Strata product did, what they were saying was, well, let's put an API in front of that that allows it to make it so people who are familiar with web development, REST-based web interfaces. Mm -hmm. Let's give them a REST-based web interface and allow them to do transactions, accounts, all the different operations against that. And so that's what they're kind of play is with Strato, and it actually works really well. Okay, so when you're cool. getting up to speed with this, I recommend checking that out. Um, it's pretty easy to get going, but yeah, it's kind of totally different from the other chains that we have there. Uh, Tendermint is another one that's out there. I, I mentioned a bunch of these. We don't have to go into the details about them, but they all kind of have a little twist on uh, what they're doing, Tyrion being a proofing engine. Mm -hmm. um, so these all have really unique features that they're bringing to the blockchain space. Yep. Um, from a dev, and then you talk about development chains. Um, I mentioned before that uh, when you start working with this, you probably don't want to go stand up whatever your production environment's going to be and start developing on top of it. That's not even how we do regular development. We usually no, start the at lab, the developer. Yeah. Right. Or and just on their desktop. Exactly. So very small space. So what can we do to do that? Well, Strato offers a thing called instant mining and allows you to do a dev chain where there's just one node. That's great because okay. you can see things go really quickly to your point about async. Uh -huh. Developers don't want to sit there and wait for consensus to run. We know consensus works. We know the algorithm works. Right. All we want to do is just test our smart contract and make sure everything works. Right. So that's one way to do it. Uh, Chain has a really nice interface to allow you to start building on top of their platform in that way. Big Chain DB is uh, is a different animal. Um, so that's a different product that basically emulates some of the functionality that a blockchain gives you, um, but they're using some different technology to do that. They have a database behind it, and they and do really high throughput transactions. Yeah, they're trying to bring the best of chains and the best of databases and smush them together. Yeah. Okay. But I think you could composite these together as you're building your DAP. Don't feel that you're limited with it. Okay, I'm working with Ethereum. That's all I can do. You could actually have modules and things inside your application that do things like if there's an area where there's high throughput, maybe you do look at something like Big Chain DB to get That was that. one of the things that was really challenging for me when I was getting started. I put up a geth node and I started slinging Web3 and JavaScript and it was all really, really hard to do. But from listening to you speak at, at different uh, conversations, uh, different conferences, learning about how I can use Strato for some things, I can use good old you know Go Ethereum uh, for different things, Truffle uh, to make the the framework and the tooling easier. So you have to bolt on a, a number of different parts. Yeah, and I'd say that's kind of a, a pro and a con. It's yeah. really good because the communities behind these things are very passionate and they're building really good products, and it's happening very fast. On the same token, it's very fragmented. And it's happening very fast. And you have to be kind of plugged into this ecosystem. Right. It's like every day it seems like there's another framework that's coming out and you're like, okay, what does that do? Like, is it different? Um, so I think there's there's heavy fragmentation there, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think yeah. it's kind of starting to come up to something better now. Absolutely. And of course, there's a lot of tooling available for you to use these frameworks and these dev blockchains. Uh, on the IDE side. Obviously, uh, at Microsoft, we've got uh, the Solidity interface into Visual Studio. Uh, Visual Studio Code uh, works great with Truffle. Um, there's Mix and Cosmos. You can download Ethereum Studio, which is kind of a self-contained apparatus for, for uh, dealing with things. Uh, you can even work with uh, good old Atom, which uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, similarities between Visual Studio Code and Atom. Uh, from an interface, but you can go all the way down low level for the folks that really want to get hardcore. They can write this stuff in Emacs or in Vim, uh, and there are even extensions for those two tools uh, to allow you to write uh, good old smart contracts. Yeah, and uh, just to mention on the Cosmos, when um, there's this, it's basically the online Solidity compiler, and the interesting thing there is you don't even need an IDE. Um, so the IDE is in the browser. So you basically just go to a website. And you have an IDE there, so you can start writing smart contracts, compile them in the browser, and you can actually deploy them to blockchains. 
So that's really great because it's a, a real smart, real quick way to get up and going uh, and, and playing. If you want to start with a Hello World, you can go out to Cosmo, uh, do those kinds of things. But do they have production uh, instances of that where you download it? Or is it all just you go to Cosmo and there it is and it's a web interface and you can do your whole tooling from that point? Yeah, it's open source. So you can obviously pull that thing down and bring it inside your enterprise walls Great. if that's what you're looking for. But uh, yeah, I think the idea there is really, I want to try something out quick. really quick. Yeah. yeah, let me just go try this. And you can actually just like copy and paste that into Visual Studio or Truffle or any of these other ones like later and say, here's my soul code, my Solidity okay. uh, code. So let's talk use. about some of those frameworks. Yeah. So basically, I walked through a couple of these most popular ones. I'll talk about block apps here a little bit first. And what I did is kind of broke these out and showed you kind of like for even from like an OSI model, like what do these things look like, the different layers um, that we're working with here. So when we're talking about building something on top of block apps, we're talking about at the foundation level, the blockchain we're going to be using is Strata. Um, so you can think of block apps. They basically have two different SDKs. You can see them on the slide here. The one in the middle says block apps slash JS, and then it has slash Xamarin. Um, so block apps JS is a library that you can pull down. It's a node-based library. You can pull it off NPM. Uh, it's up there in the public repository. And then there's also one that's just called block. Now, I'll talk about the differences between those two in a second, but both of those things are basically built to be a wrapper around Strato. Okay. I mentioned that Strato is an API that sits on top of a blockchain. You can think of it just like Azure, right? Nobody, uh, or very few people I know of, are actually writing directly to the API in Azure. They go grab an SDK that we built in whatever language they're comfortable with, and then they use that thing to actually make the REST calls that's actually going in because they're quite complex. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing here. So you can actually interface directly with Strato if you wanted to from your application, or you can start laying one of these other things on there and it builds more rapid development environments. So it allows you to build faster. And that's nice because block apps, not only do they have the SDK, they also have the underlying chain structure itself. Correct. And so that's not Ethereum running down there. That's not Bitcoin running on it. It's its own thing. Correct. And so they've got, it's kind of a first party integration story that they've built on that. Yeah. And what I'm showing here, so we have the SDK there with block apps JS. Now block has a dependency on block apps JS. Um, so block, you can think of it as like a CLI. But it can even be beyond that. I see a lot of people actually building on top of it. So it's a very, if you think about the REST API to Strato level being complex, this is a very kind of, think about it as a dumbed down version. Mm -hmm. I want to create an account. I want to upload a contract. I want to execute a transaction. I mean, just the core things that you want to do. Basic stuff. Yeah. Very simple API. This is what Block gives you. If you want to go a step down and say, no, I want to talk directly to Block Apps JS and do maybe a couple more advanced things, you can totally do that. Okay. Block just makes it easier, you know. So I put block up there at the top. You can have your DAP actually point to block, which will call, call down and through into Strato, or you can have your decentralized app talk to block FJS directly. Slightly more code, a little right. bit more complex, but you can get a couple more features if you do it. That right. Way. It's a little. Yeah. The trade-off is it's it's a little more verbose, a little more complex, but you're going to get the additional features that that SDK provides on top of it. That's correct. Yep. Um, another one, and we'll move on here to uh, Truffle. So we've been mentioning this a lot. Um, it's got a lot of traction out there in the industry. It's a very nice set of tools uh, built by uh, Tim Coulter primarily. It's an open source project. And essentially, they're slightly different, right? So they're talking to both public Ethereum, private Ethereum. I haven't marked as Azure here, but you could run that on any infrastructure. We as prefer Azure. We prefer Azure. Yeah, but, uh, yeah and, and Testnet as well. And uh, so basically, this can talk to any of the public or the standard Ethereum interfaces. And so you have the Truffle SDK, and then you have these clients that are going to work with it. Now, one thing to think about here is I put TestRPC up here at the top. TestRPC basically emulates a blockchain. So you can think about that when you start developing. It's in memory. It's, like, it's almost like an emulator, right? Okay. So basically, you're going to fire this TestRPC thing up. It's going to create some accounts for you, and you can pass parameters and kind of customize it. But by default, it would give you like 10 accounts. Okay. And then you can just basically hook up your DAP that's up at your top level. You can start talking directly to the blockchain through whatever Test client RPC. tools that you want. Yeah. Okay. And you can start simulating it, running your workloads, make sure everything works. Again, has nothing to do with blockchain. It's instant, so you're not having to wait for mining and all that kind of happy stuff to happen. It's really good for developers. And then once you're done, you say, okay, everything works. We can then, replace the pointer to test RPC with the actual blockchain. And this is really good because when I was learning it as, as a noob, uh, this is the exact framework that I started with, was with Truffle. I, 
I ended up with test RPC. I used Truffle to help me scaffold some things uh, and then built my very simple app around that and was able to instantly deploy. I didn't have to worry about creating a, a big consensus network and things like that. When it was done, I took my Solidity files and I just ported them over and, and deployed them into Mist, uh, into the Mist browser and off it went. Yep. A great tool. Yeah, you should take a look at it. And we'll do some demos on it. And then the last being Visual Studio. So this one again is a kind of a partnership that we were working with Consensus, but you know, we're starting to expand this as well now to support other chains. Mm -hmm. But the initial one here was to basically say, how can we make it super easy for someone to just come in and start building a, a DAP and how, or and upload a smart contract and get the thing actually running? Because as Derek mentioned, it can be frustrating a little bit when you first start and all this stuff's new to you. Figuring out, okay, I need to have these three things running. How do I make sure I got everything? You don't running have to talk, right and there's yeah. IPC stuff going on, and there's ports and everything involved. Right. And you're like, okay, this is too much. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going to give up here. I don't know what's yeah. happening. So what we did is said, okay, can we build on top of what the guys did at Block, um, and basically build that into Visual Studio? So what we did is took Solidity as a language and put that into Visual Studio. So now you have an authoring environment where it has you know text highlighting and spacing and all that kind of normal stuff that you'd expect in an IDE. And then on top of that, we can do the compilation inside Visual Studio. So as you do a compile, you'll see the output actually come into the output window in Visual Studio. You can see if you make a mistake, it'll actually give you the output back from the Soul C compiler. So you can actually see like where you made your mistake oh, great. and you can fix it. Okay. And then you can basically, by default, without even touching anything, you just right click on that, that contract and deploy it to Azure. Okay. Um, so that's really cool because you didn't have to do any infrastructure. So right. me as a developer, maybe I come in there and I say, that blockchain stuff's really cool, but I don't even want to think I'm about setting up the infrastructure. I'm just a JavaScript developer. Yeah, I'm, just, yeah. A, I'm a, just a JS guy, yeah. So just give me a blockchain that I can hit, like test RPC mm -hmm. or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we did was said, okay, well, we already have an instance running out there, like a dev instance that we can use publicly. Um, we can just point to that. And then if you want to move it to a private instance, Spin up your own Shadow instance in Azure and just change the pointer in your config file. Fantastic. Love it. So that kind of wraps the module on, uh, you know, actually building and at development of these dap dApps. We're going to talk about some of that in the architecture and development, uh, and we'll show some, de some demos on this as well. We like demos. All right. We'll see you guys later. Thanks. Welcome back to our architectural design sessions. Uh, we haven't touched very much about identity in developing our dApps, so we're going to dive into smart contracts and how dApps work. So to get started, I'm going to throw it over to my wingman. Thanks, Maverick. All right, so we'll get started here. One of the things to think about with identity, the identity solutions are going to be, as you can imagine, slightly different when we talk about decentralized applications and identities. Why is it important? Let's start there. Yeah, let's talk about that. So what, what are the biggest kind of identity systems in the world and what are kind of the dangers around them right now? We're essentially building centralized systems all over the place. Right, yeah, whether it be um, a sovereign identity like your social security card correct. or a virtual identity like Active Directory. Correct, or even something like you know your Facebook account and these kind of things out there. So these things are centralized repositories of names. Right. What happens out there in the world when hackers get involved? They want to target those centralized resources. Right, they're going to get my username my possibly my password uh, and be able to do identity theft and those kinds of things so sure same thing happens in the database world if we think about a database when we have a centralized database that's where people are going to attack as opposed to if we spread it out in a decentralized manner and have a consensus algorithm uh, less of a chance for them being able to attack all those nodes at one time okay that's kind of the the lead up to it and really what we're thinking about here is if we had a decentralized identity how could that how could that function for us so if we took an identity for, and I'll use users, but again, these could be objects. Devices, like mentioned right. Before, doesn't matter, but we use users because it's easy to kind of comprehend. So essentially, we have a blockchain over here. Um, we'll draw our little blockchain again. And this guy basically is going to be an anchor point for us. We mentioned anchors before. And really what that's about is saying, okay, I got a key pair over here, right? I got the private key. And I'm going to store some anchor up here on the blockchain about me. So I have an address up here now, an identifier. Mm -hmm. It's one, two, three, four, right? So this is Kale that's out there right now. And that's now. a public key. Public key. It's my address out in the blockchain. Remember that when we put something on the blockchain with our key pairs, when mm -hmm. we create an account contract, it's actually derived from there. So that's what. So in addition part. to the address and the public key, this could also be to keep things small out on the blockchain. It could be a URI mm -hmm. to something else, like a profile. 
Correct. And if you look at some of the guys who are working in this space, Blockstack is one of the big ones that we've been working with. Hey, Blockstack. And Blockstack is really essentially a naming service. Okay. So you can imagine that just like IP addresses, addresses in the blockchain are kind of hard to comprehend. Yeah, right? this means nothing even here on the whiteboard. It's a really long, you know, string of numbers, and you say, okay, that I, that's there. That's Kale. I oh. don't understand okay. what that means, you know. So wait, basically, we can use their service to tie this to what Derek's talking about, this URI. And this is, this is off-chain. So now we can have either Kale or Derek.id. So now we basically can call in to a service over here running on Blockstack, which basically can do these lookups for us. Okay. And can tell us where this guy is over here, right? So that's pretty cool. It does a nice lookup service for us and allows us to do name registration. Okay. Now, they're based uh, specifically on Bitcoin right now. Yep, this is Bitcoin. There's something similar for Ethereum? Uh, uh, there's nothing uh, to Ethereum right now. There's a thing called ENS. Okay. It's being built. It's called Ethereum Name Service. So that's more like DNS. Yeah. Okay, so finding your contract, Ethereum Name Service, finding a person or possibly a different type of URL, mm -hmm. that would be something beneficial for Blockstack, okay? Right. But we see this as a growing market, and there's a lot of people looking at this. Why? Space, you know? Other than decentralizing the identity, what are some of the other benefits that, that someone might have by holding on to a private key and federating themselves out here into the block wor block stack world. Well, this kind of is like, a, if you think about it, this is like a foundational element to an identity system. So in this case, what are we getting out of this? If we use this whole stack that we've been talking about here, we get an easy to remember ID over here. Right. And we can now start to use that in other systems. So if we talked about what, what's this actually function for us? If we had two people here, right? So we got a person here and we have a person here. You draw strange stick figures. Right. Yeah. These guys are happy. Good. This guy's kind of smirking a little bit, but <laughs> missing his eyes. <laughs> anyway, so these guys basically could engage in a contract, right? Okay. So let's say we have a contract over here, and I can provide basically a signature. I can sign a document. You're signing so, a document. So let's just say this is a doc. It's an actual physical doc. It could be off-chain, whatever. Like a Word document. But this is attached to a smart contract, obviously, um, so that we could basically keep track of that thing. So we have a, a pointer to wherever this thing exists. Right. We have a zero x one two three wherever this document lives, and then we could have different people sign it, right? Okay. So I could sign it with my my private key. I could issue challenges to this guy to say sign it. Who are you? Okay, I know your public key. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to encrypt it with that, and then you only you would be able to do it with your to, private key. Right? Right, okay, countersigning. Exactly. Okay. So we can do these kind of models. We can also involve a third party, right? So we could have a third party in here who's validating all these ideas. Like an escrow. Correct. Okay. So this guy could be the guy who actually creates the document, and he could be issuing, you know, requests to have people sign things for him. Okay. So again, like a DocuSign type situation where we have multiple parties that need to prove who they are. Mm -hmm. There's a longer term strategy if you look up on uh, GitHub and if you look at our identity space, Daniel Buckner is working on this. And essentially what they're looking to, to provide is more of an attestation type service. What attestation means is prove to me who you are. Mm -hmm. So it's that challenge. Yeah, so if you think about like um, the DMV or something like that, in the future we're thinking, and this is the kind of stuff we're working on, and there's others in this space working on this too. You mentioned the DMV. So if we had the DMV over here, right? In the future, these guys could basically, I could have a service out here that the, uh, I could issue requests through to these guys to say, I, I'm Kale, and I have to prove something to them physically maybe. I have to show them my birth certificate or something in that okay. nature. Once I do, they could sign something in my identity profile over here. Now I got that thing. So they've signed it with their key, and the only person that could have signed it is the DMV. Right. So they have their private key over here. Right. And I have my private key over here. Now in the future, Derek comes along and says, hey, you want to come into my bar? You need to show me your driver's license so that I can see it's real. And I show him my driver's license, he says, how do I know that's real? Well, it was could, signed by... He could actually validate it through that. We could have an app in the future to allow him to actually validate that on the fly to go check that signature that he did, issue a challenge to me so that I could sign it, and then we could validate my identity through this attestation. So the next time I'm in a bar, I just show them my phone, and they let me in. Yeah, it's no problem. No problem. Okay. <laughs> so we've got that, but it's also, it, it's not just the person. We could take that to things as well. Sure. And the same model that we could use there, basically... Um, we're actually thinking about it um, between how you interact with devices. Let me throw a scenario out here. So here's Derek. That's me. He's very thin. <laughs> and he goes to the store and he buys a, a router, let's say. 
he's got a new little wireless router he's going to put in his house. He wants to have fast internet and stuff. So he goes and buys this router. Okay. Now, we think about this as saying, okay, here's the establishment that sold him the router. And this guy has a profile up here, right? An identity profile that talks about his house over here, right? So in your house, you automatically have other devices that talk to your Wi-Fi stuff right? mm -hmm. or whatnot. So these things already are pointing to an access point. They know an access point, whatever the, let's say CHX or something, just some access point name that's over there. Mm -hmm. So when you get this device home, what can happen is if we transfer our ownership, again, through a smart contract, this is the, this is the business. Um, We'll just call this business. This is the one that's selling you the device. This router. Right. So they're going to sell you that router. They're going to transfer ownership to you. Mm -hmm. Now, because we have this profile out here that knows all the stuff about your house, by the time you get this router home, he can configure it. Ah, so you get some automatic configuration of devices that get sold from businesses uh, because these other things are aligned to my profile. If you think about it, like um, you buy some new thing that uses your Wi-Fi, let's say... Um, Okay, yeah, think about it like a security camera that you're going to put out here. All right. So the security camera obviously is going to need to be configured. If you paid attention to the news, you noticed that there was a big hack that just happened right. recently with DynDNS. Right. And what that was about was pre-configured devices. So one of the big problems with these kind of things, when you start talking about these webcams and things like that that you buy from a store, right. is when you bring it home, you have to configure it. Right. Right, and the configuration is kind of an issue for somebody who's maybe non-technical. So what do they do? They tend to stay with the defaults. Right. What happens then? People hack into Admin those devices. And password. So what if we were able to take this device and be able to transfer ownership to it, again, from the business. The business would transfer ownership to say this serial number over here, um, and I'm just going to represent it in hex here, but this serial number now belongs to Derek. Right? So when it belongs to Derek, when he comes home and plugs that into his device, up here we already know what his Wi-Fi is. Right? And that might be by virtue of uh, there's some extension to my profile service where another organization has extended that profile to do something like smart home things go here. Correct. And then you just plug in the serial numbers, they auto configure, that's not at all creepy. Right. So obviously we could basically just have this thing auto configure. The interesting thing is, what happens when Derek gets tired of this webcam and he puts it on eBay? Right. What happens if he sells his cell phone? Mm -hmm. You know, cell phones have tons of PII data. Sure. In. And people are like non-technical, they don't know how to re-erase them, they either destroy them, then they don't want to sell them. Right. So they're saying, how do I make sure I get everything sure. cleared off there? Sure. We're thinking about that one in the future as well. The configuration for that could be stored here, such that when you transfer ownership to the, to the next party, it automatically clears it. Because he's not you now, he has his own profile, which will then overwrite whatever the profile was. So it gets erased when that transfer happens. It's a whole brave new world. Started out by Blockstack, that's very cool. All right. Thank you very much for uh, checking out this architectural session. We'll see you next time. Thanks. In this demo, we're going to walk through how to use the Visual Studio extension that exists inside of uh, our marketplace that allows you to work with uh, some of the block blockchain components behind the scenes, and specifically with the Strato and the Block product. Um, essentially, what this does is allows developers to very quickly be able to start building smart contracts and actually start building uh, dApps on top of a blockchain uh, without having to mess around with a lot of the infrastructure involved in getting that stuff started. So we're going to go ahead and uh, get started here. I'll show you how this works. So the first thing we need to do is have a Strato instance running. Um, and I talked through this in another video, but I'll show you really quickly how to do that. You just click on the new button up here at the top left in the Azure portal. You type in Strato, click on the Strato instance up here. Again, description, lots of documentation on how to use it, and you essentially click on the Create button down here in the lower left corner. Fill out the parameters about the size of virtual machine, the usernames you want to use to log into it with, and whatnot. A couple minutes later, you have your Strato instance running. Um, now, in order to use the Visual Studio extension, we actually need to have Block running. So, we'll need to actually start a, a local web server here that's going to run Block uh, itself, and we'll talk to that blockchain. So, in order to do that, I'm going to open up Visual Studio Code and show you that when you spin up your Block instance, you'll want to make sure that you put your uh, correct Strato endpoint in here, and you can see mine's set correctly now. It's set to my Strato endpoint that's running in Azure. 
that's the only configuration I need to do. Don't even need to create any users. I can just have a bare bones one, and I can just say block start. After a few seconds, we'll see uh, the Express server start up here, and it'll be listening on port 8000, and it'll actually be pointing to our endpoint, and you can see which endpoint it's pointing to, and so there we are, we're listening on port 8000, so everything's great. Now we'll open up Visual Studio, and um, this requires an extension, um, so essentially I'll show you real quick on the web. If you just come out to uh, this URL, so it's marketplace.visualstudio.com, uh, you click on Visual Studio, and then you just type the word Solidity, which is the language uh, used to write smart contract. You can see that we have the extension here, and you can just hit download and install it directly from here. Um, there's uh, lots of you know notes up here about what what's being built there. Um, a link to my blog here, um, which actually details uh, how this actually works too. So if you have trouble getting getting running with this, you can go look at that blog. It has some really good uh, tutorials on how to go through this. Um, but essentially, once we have that installed, when we come back into Visual Studio, um, you can always check it under the Tools menu here. Um, so under Tools, and then Extensions and Updates right here. So if we click on that guy, and then type in the word Solidity in the top left here, you'll see that we have it installed. This is where we get uninstall it or, or upgrade it or whatnot. It'll automatically upgrade as, as new things come out. And so we just click on New Project now and you'll see that we have an actual new category in here. So we have Solidity in here. It's a first class language. We have a couple templates in here. Um, we're just going to build a smart contract here to begin with. So we'll click on that. And once we click on that, uh, we, it scaffolds out an application for us here. Now there's some samples that are out here. There's a source folder for you to drop your own in. And basically from here, we can right click and I want to show you this. Uh, we actually have added some integration to do the compilation and deployment directly from inside Visual Studio. So this is really cool um, because it, we don't have to leave the IDE. We don't have to go do anything. And if we take a look at what's inside of here, we have, we'll take our simple storage. You know, we have text highlighting, we have, so if there's multiple, uh, so you could track if you misspelled something, um, we can actually do the compilation from inside of here. We have like autocomplete and everything for the different keywords that's inside the Solidity language to help you kind of build these things out. Now, once we have everything done, we can actually compile this thing, so we'll click on compile. And we've integrated it into the output window here. I'll zoom in on that. You can see the compilation of the smart contracts completed. It dropped the binaries out in the bin folder. Um, but actually, if we're just getting started, we don't even care about the bin files. We just want to deploy this thing. So if we hit deploy smart contract, we'll actually see this go out to a blockchain. So after a few seconds, what we'll see is a browser window pop up here. And this is going to that local instance I had running. You can see we're using test user and the password. I'll show you where the password is here in a second. Uh, there's the address where it lives on the blockchain and we actually have a cool interface here with Block that allows us to basically uh, execute the smart contract and see how it functions. So we could set a value here and you can see down here at the bottom when I set that the stored data actually changed to one. And then if I do a get on it you'll see our transaction result actually return to one. So it's showing that we're actually executing the smart contract, and this is all dynamic. So if you create your own method names, they'll show up here uh, with whatever parameters. You can move Ether around, you can test all this kind of stuff out. Now back to Visual Studio, uh, where is this configured? If you right click on the decentralized app, or whatever the name of your app is, you'll see in here we've added some properties. Uh, so there's a blockchain password, blockchain service URL, blockchain user. So what it happens is when this thing, when you hit right click and deploy, there was no users in our block instance. So it went and checked to say, is there a test user out there? If there's not, go ahead and create one with a password of testing. Now you could obviously change these to something else that you want to use. You can see we're pointing at localhost 8000, which is where our block instance was running. Um, this guy, and you can see over here, we still have the debug output from block showing us everything that's happening as we're doing this. So from a developer sense, we have all the tools we need to build a, a smart contract, actually get it up there and get it running, and actually start testing it. And then we can come along later, and we'll show this in some other demos, that you can actually um, you know, start building dApps on top of this that will interact with these. So hopefully this is helpful to get started with building smart contracts using Visual Studio.
In this demo, we're going to walk through a ASP.NET application, an MVC application to be specific, um, that's heavily server-side based, and we're going to show how this thing can actually communicate with something like Strato with block apps. Um, I get a lot of uh, feedback from the field about, uh, you know, these things look great. We have a lot of APIs and a lot of different things out here, but getting some real-world demos out here is kind of key to get people thinking about how to actually start building their dApps uh, using existing technology, whether it's Node, Python, Java, .NET. So in this case, we're going to use a... Uh, I built a simple application here that essentially allows us to uh, create a new accounts and everything through MVC application through ASP.NET and, and on a blockchain as well as upload new contracts, uh, be able to track versions of contracts, um, those types of features. We're adding some more features to it with transactions and whatnot, but right now we just have kind of the simple scaffolding there to get this running. So I just want to show you how that works and it involves a couple different components. So the first piece would be the actual uh, blockchain. So we've talked about Strato a few times here today and uh, the first thing we need to do is click on new, type in Strato, uh, just so anybody that hasn't seen this We'll click on Strato, and again, we have a nice description. We have the developer documentation. We click Create down here in the bottom corner. Uh, tell it what we want to name it, how big uh, we want the VM to be, and what user account to use. And in a few minutes, we have our own Strato instance. Um, so we have Strato running. Uh, we also have a block instance running here. So I have my MVA demo. Block is running here on port 8000, pointing to my Strato instance that's running up there in Azure. Uh, the other component that we do need is document DB. So in this case, we're actually going to be storing some metadata about contracts in our DAP. Uh, Block doesn't store everything about the contract. Specifically, the thing we want to track is a relationship between an owner and a contract. So I'll show you how that kind of works. Uh, but what you need to do beforehand, let's go look at the actual application. So here's the app. Um, and if we go into our web config, where we usually keep our configuration values, um, you can see inside of there, uh, we have some things here. Let me go ahead and zoom in on this. So we have some off-chain components here. Uh, we have a Strato endpoint up here. Um, so the Strato endpoint obviously is pointing to our local host. Um, this is going to our block instance. It's going to talk to Strato. And then here are off-chain. Essentially we have a URL here that's going to go to um, whatever database that we create for document DB in Azure. And then we have the key uh, associated with that. Now I haven't updated a key, but I did create a this ahead of time so we didn't have to wait on it. You can see it's right here and I'll show you where you can get the keys at. So once you provision one of these um, the next step is you just need to get the keys so we can communicate with it. So we click on keys over here. Let me show you where that was. It's right here on the, the left nav and then inside of here again here's our URL. I could copy that out but I already have it and I'll just grab the primary key and these are read write. We also have read only keys if you just wanted to do read only. So there, now we've updated that. Now you also notice there's a couple values below that, which is the storage DB name and the storage collection name, we call it. So inside of here, um, DocDB stores things slightly differently. It's a NoSQL type database. And so we essentially create a namespace over here, a collection. You could think of it almost like a, uh, like a table in a relational database, for lack of a better term. And then database just being a a, a bigger container that's holding multiple of those collections inside of it. So um, the cool thing about this is we don't have to define any schema and we don't even have to create any of this stuff up front. We just basically put these two pieces of info, the storage name where the DocDB repo namespace is and the key to access it. The app will take care of creating all this stuff for us. Now um, let's walk through. Whoops, uh, I didn't save that so let me go back and save that. drop our key in there. We'll save it. Um, so basically um, a typical application here. Uh, so at our startup over here uh, we have our bundle config which has our normal stuff. We have a couple of JS files that we've added in here to handle the client side of it. Um, obviously it's a bootstrap application. We have an account, a contract, and a transaction controller and each one of these has their own methods so very resty that we have you know you can basically get all the accounts, get a specific account, and create an account wouldn't really make sense to delete account uh, because these are on the blockchain. Uh, contract, we have similar model here um, where we basically have a way to retrieve all contracts, retrieve by name, retrieve by name and address. So a bit more granularity there um, and that's where we've added some of the features with the 
uh, DocDB. And then we also have the transaction controller, which is something that we're working on to basically allow you to create transactions and kind of interact with those. Um, but I'll just be demonstrating the contracts and accounts here uh, today. In the models folder, we basically have our data models. Um, so these are everything from our block accounts to our block contracts, uh, as well as our signatures, which you can see have things like the owner address, owner name. Um, these are some of those new things that we've added there. And then we have some view models as well. Uh, and our tra transaction model is actually defined there as well. So if we fire this guy up, um, let's go ahead and start the application from inside Visual Studio. Um, this is an app that obviously we could deploy up to Azure or on-premises if we choose so in the future. Um, but right now we'll just go ahead and do a build and run this thing locally here uh, on, our, on our machine locally. So what we should see after a few moments is um, IS Express starts up and we get our application started up here. We'll see um, kind of a simple UI here that allows us to basically uh, do some CRUD operations on these different uh, types of components that make up the blockchain. So here we go. We have our DAP. We have some good links over here for setting up a new block server. Um, you can click on these. These are all hot links. Yeah, they go out to the real stuff. Here's the integrated experience with Visual Studio and then the API documentation. You can see up top here we have accounts and contracts. So if we go into accounts, what we should see here, we can actually look at the back end. You can see we call get users. Um, so we can actually see the call coming through, but we don't actually have any users yet. So in this case, we want to go ahead and create users. So we just click on this little plus button here, and we could say, OK, we want to create a user, and we're just going to call this test user. Give him a password of test, and we'll go ahead and create him. Sure, we'll save the password. So now you can see that uh, the test user got created here. We have a little tile, and we have an address for him. You can also pop out here and see that we actually did a post with the test user. He hit his faucet. Uh, right here was the faucet call. Remember, that's going to give him some ether. Um, so we kind of have a, a cool thing there with the user. And we could add more. I mean, we could have uh, test user 2, test. And they just keep adding on here, right? So you get the idea. Now, once we have some users, we can also go through the, the contract section as well. So in the contracts, uh, we'll give this a second to load up here. Now, what's happening now, because it's the first time, it's actually going out to that DocDB and seeing that, hey, I have an account out here that I can use, but I haven't created anything. Remember, we didn't create anything inside our DocDB. So what's interesting is if you come out here now, I'm just popping out into Azure to that DocDB, what we should see here is we have a database that got created called SignDocDB, and we also have contracts inside of there, which is going to hold our uh, contract information. Now inside of here, um, we have some pretty cool tools up here to allow us to kind of explore what's happening. We have this document explorer, and let me show you where I clicked on that so you're clear. It's right here. Um, if you click on that guy, basically comes up and lists out all of your databases and then the collections inside of those. So here we have contracts, and then we can basically create new ones up here. We can upload them, we can refresh, and if there was any, they would show up right here. Now we'll see that actually fill out as we start adding some. So in here we say, hey, we got a contract here. We're just going to call this the simple storage. Uh, we'll use that as a good example here. We'll call this KL admin. Uh, actually, we need to use test user. That's our test guy. We're going to give the owner of who this guy is. And then we have to give the actual source. Now um, what I'm going to do is just pop over to um, our block instance and grab uh, one of those sample contracts. So just give me one second here, we'll grab that. So here's our simple storage. Again, same one that we used in the other demos, but we're just going to use this for demo purposes. So we paste this guy in here, hit create. Now what's actually happening here now is we did a local compilation and we signed it with our key. So basically uh, the test, remember I had to put the user in there, so test user actually used his keys to actually sign it. So here's the address of where it lives on the blockchain. And uh, you can actually see different versions. So right here's the first one. Now what's cool is if we said, okay, I want to upload the same contract. Maybe I made a change to it, you know, in the future. Um, so we fixed a bug or something in it and we want to go ahead and re-upload it. 
So if I upload that, what you're going to see is this. I don't know if you can see that, but if you notice, this little uh, badge here actually changed to two. Because it's basically saying, hey, we actually have two versions of that now um, that live on the blockchain. And this is the latest one, the CEB8CC. If you click on this, you can actually see a running list. Um, and the one at the bottom is the latest one. But So this was the earlier one, this is the later one. And you can actually click on these things. Um, and it'll take you out to, uh, it should open another web browser here, and take you out to block itself and allow you to actually debug that thing. Um, I'm going to jump over there for a second, but that, that'll pop up another tab and allow you to actually exercise the application. Now what's cool is if you come in here too and said uh, the same contract, so simple storage again, but this time we use a different user, so we use test user 2. And we paste the exact same source in here. Watch what happens. So this guy is a separate user. So it actually created another instance over here. And this guy has his own versioning going on. So you can see that that's one of the ways. And if you look out here in Doc Explorer now, if we hit refresh here, you're going to see we have just some records starting to pile up here. So this is the identifier for the first one, which basically is keeping track of those two contracts and saying, hey, they actually go with this owner, and his name is test user. And then if you look at the second one, you see he only has one instance right now, and it's actually pointing to this owner, which is test user 2. So just a simple way to start leveraging some of the uh, off-chain components. Um, and something to keep in mind is that the off-chain components and the stuff we're keeping here is simply addresses. So it's simply addresses. We have an owner name and a contract name. Other than that, that's all we have off-chain. Um, so we haven't encrypted anything because there was no need. Um, whether these addresses are already available on the blockchain, you could go get that information freely um, if it was on a public blockchain. If we wanted, if we chose so, we could use our keys to actually encrypt this data as well. So it's a kind of a cool case where we can pull things off chain and be able to use those uh, to, to basically scale the system a little bit better and uh, just have anchors that exist on the chain, um, just using that term to kind of say, hey, we have our accounts and we have an actual contract as an anchor, but we have a bunch of other metadata that maybe doesn't need to be in the smart contract and we can kind of keep that off chain. So I hope this just gave you a, a, a little bit of a taste for what we can do. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to continue to expand on this example and, and it'll allow you to create transactions and all those types of things that go along with that on top of this. But I hope this was a good start for you on DAP and as well as some off-chain components.